philosophy of money. And this is the book itself, right? This is the George Zimmel. It's a classic. You got it. Good, good, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, like it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a great, uh, it's a great work. Um, and some people say it's the supplement to Capital. You know, um, uh, because Marx never really dealt with the psychology of money. Yeah, and um, both Weber, Max Weber, um, and Karl Mannheim. Uh, two obviously great social thinkers of the 19th and early 20th century uh, were critical of the book, but still respected it very much. Uh, their, their criticism was based on a, the, he conflated the money economy with that of capital. But, you know, we'll talk about that. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to go Wait, through sorry, this. The, that criticism was of who? I'm sorry? The, the criticism was of who? Of, of Zimmel's Zimmel. work on the philosophy of money, the psychology of money, or the philosophy of money, I'm sorry. So um, this was 1900, another book that came at the same time as the theory of speculation, Husserl's logical investigations, philosophy of money, and, um, you know, um, um, of course, interpretation of dreams. So 1900 is Nietzsche's death. So if we're going to do, you know, again, this... Uh, kind of date of, date of dating, right? That the, the 20th century was ushered in by a major study on money, a major study on dreams and fetish, right? a major study on what is speculative capital, you know, a, a major study on logic in terms of how logic works, in terms of signification, expressive and indicative signs um, from, from Husserl, and then of course the psychology of money itself and the money economy and what it does. So I'm looking through there, what I'm very interested in is everyday life and money. Yeah, what, the, what is that psychology really about? And he has many, many good chapters. Um, I mean, I've already started to kind of sift through it. Um, I mean, we may read, it's divided into three parts, a preface um, and uh, an analytical part and a synthetic part. And the analytical synthetical he's getting from Kant that you first undo the schema, right? And then there, you begin to build the synthesis around the schema. So he begins with value in money, value as substance in money, and then of course the um, <coughs> money in the uh, sequences of purposes, how it acts in the world. And then the synthetic part is about individual freedom, and I thought we'd read that. So I'll, I'm going to send out an email. And then the money equivalent and personal values, and then finally the style of life. And since lifestyle, and we've been talking about this so much, from the phones to, you know, how people dress, and the elements of the fashion system, all of this, I think this would be a good chapter to read to in the style of life, which kind of is at the end. So I'll try to sift through it. One of his major contributions is value-price relations, and, you know, really asking the question of value in the money economy. You know, what, what, what does that really mean as a value? So it's a wonderful thing, and if you're interested also, David Frisbee has written a book on Zimmel. It's actually very good, who edited this. You know, he's, uh, he's very good on Zimmel as a, as a thinker. So I thought Zimmel for, the, um, for the, um, you know, the first session, and I'll send out an email, and we may be joined by other people then, too, that have been unable. Sam, Soraya, Victorio, uh, Pellucci, who used to come remember Victoria yeah, from yeah, Long Island? Yeah, forum, yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. They all said they, you know, want to, you know, kind of continue. And then there are a few people, uh, friends of mine. Also, I did get good news that Phil Nicholson, who's an excellent presenter and a great labor historian, is very interested in teaching the course with us. He really wants to. So he's, uh, you know, yeah. And maybe we could do him on a Monday night or something like that. I'm not sure if it's schedule or Tuesday. But we'll figure it out. You know, he's, he's one a minute. So anyway, um, so th this would be the next sequence, right? Okay. From Marx's notion of fictitious capital. Obviously you see that what Hilferding is trying to do is to look at fictitious capital and finance capital outside of industrial capital. And I thought I'd start again with the graph you mentioned mm -hmm. last time just to kind of reorient ourselves. <laughs> Excuse me, and um, you know, then we would go on to more contemporary stuff. And I think it's important to read the Chukalas piece because I think it's kind of the state of art, state of the art, uh, um, in terms of nomadic capital and what that might mean, you know, to us today. I thought we'd also do some stuff on the derivative, 
and uh, you know I have good. a whole slew of articles. Maybe something how academic and the life of the mind is affected by the derivative markets. I'm trying to look for things that are very accessible instead of us having to plow, plow through that. How the logic of the derivative plays out in the institutions, you know, and in institutional control. You were do, saying, yeah? do you want to give an, a reading assignment now or wait until the uh, email? I think I'll do it in the email because I want to study this carefully. I don't want to read over, over, I mean, the whole book is worth, I, I mean, I haven't read the whole book. I mean, I've read certain sections pretty carefully. Uh, you know, I, I taught this uh, many years ago. But, um, um, you know, for example, just things like this. Freedom exists in conjunction with duties. This is under individual freedom, you know. Um, money payment is the foremost congruent with personal freedom, <laughs> right? So he has a whole psychology of the self and money you know, and the individual in money. And then he has a possession, the mutual dependence of having and being, you know, how, how this starts, starts to go. The possession of money and the self, you know. So I'm, I'm looking at this mostly in terms of the synthetic part and the psychology that he gets, because this is really his major um, uh, contribution. And then he has a whole section on this lifestyle which is pretty easy to read, little things on, you know, the preponderance, and this is very interesting, of intellectual over emotional functions brought about by the money economy. You know, how we have this tendency to rationalize, think, think in terms of the money economy at the expense of sentiment, at the expense of desire, et cetera. You know, and this, this operates as well. Uh, lack of character and the objectivity of the style of life, the role of intellect and money with regard to um, content. You know, so he's, he's very thorough. This is a this is a major work, unfortunately, not really studied among the left. You know, it's uh, very few people, I think, have done this. But he was a teacher of Georgi e. Lukács, as was Weber, and in fact, Lukács in the preface to the. 1967 edition in English of History and Glass Consciousness says his eyes were tinged with the spectacles of Zimbel and Weber, and he missed some things on reification, which we can, you know, extend, you know, when we get get there. Yeah. So anyway. It's good to get your suggestions ahead of time too. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll get these out hopefully in a week or, or two that you guys can start doing it. And let's let's figure maybe early September we can pick this up. I doubt Rick's going to do anything until late September, early October, so we could probably pick up uh, the Sunday after Labor Day. Yeah, yeah something um, like that. Which, no, not good? If we, I don't know if Fashion we're week? Under, yeah. And what's what's the what, next one after that? Huh? The one after that's good. Okay, that's it's what, like the, the 16th? Second, um, the 16th, yeah. 16th, okay. I could okay. be in school. If we're going to do brunch. You'll be in school? Yeah. On uh, Sunday? Not on Sunday, but I'll just be in school. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is better. Than it's school. weird. Yeah. <laughs> back yeah. to school. I'm going to go back to school, too. Yeah. yeah I, but I, I need it in certain I was looking at the courses, undergraduate courses, are not that interesting. Like, a whole, like, semester on, it doesn't seem like very, you know, like, I would rather spend a year just reading Marx or spend a year just reading Heidegger. You don't do that. No, I know that. That's not going to happen. I know that. Person. It's just a problem. My imagination, yeah, my, yeah. my dreams. <laughs> if you go to Duquesne University to the philosophy department, mm -hmm. you might be able to get a, a year-long seminar in Marx. Okay. Yeah, from the phenomenological tradition. You may, may be able to. I'm not sure. Yeah, we're ongoing. If you go to Yale and you're, happy, you're lucky enough to know Michael Denning, who also I saw at the left forum, he's willing to teach a course for us. Oh. You, you can do a... You can do a um, you can do a, a, a three-year-long capital reading project. Oh, wow. Yeah, with him. Right? But you don't get credit. Right? <laughs> you don't get school credit. You don't get capital credit, <laughs> so to speak. You get, you get reading credit. You get mind credit. Something like that. So anyway, yes. Yeah, no, then I, you're not going to read Heidegger or Marx for a, you know, for a year. And, uh, and especially, uh, you know, yeah, these days. Yeah. Yeah, especially. Yeah. I mean, the foundation has been destroyed. It, it looks know? that way. You should have one year, primarily, of reading the classics. Reading Aristotle and Plato, selected works, you know. I mean, this is going to be in my curriculum proposal for the institution. What? I'm sorry? They're all good. Yes. Yes, you would read the metaphysics slowly. <laughs> you know, you would at least have an attempt to the metaphysics, to the poetics, to the rhetoric. 
If you want to learn about civic discourse, if you read Aristotle's rhetoric for a year, you're going to figure out almost every code that's going on in the political spectrum today. It's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know, I mean, I'm, I, despite my prejudice of being, you know, born of Greek parents, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, anyway, I mean, it's amazing, you know, they weren't born of that 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 part of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. but anyway, so so, and in Plato, the ability to to understand dialogue, to really understand what communication is beyond that of this back and forth you know, active, reactive kind of things, where a real dialogue emerges around concepts and ideas. Yeah, that's another thing. To read the Phaedrus, right? Both on love, but also on the difference between the act of speaking and the act of writing, and what how culture takes this up, and why one is privileged over the other in the Western tradition. Or the Mino, how do you teach? <laughs> you know, how do you ultimately elicit, you know, from those who do not know, but we think they know that it's already inside the innate structure of the Pythagorean moment in, in, in that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you really change, you know, things like Castro did, literacy campaigns in Cuba? How do these things operate? You know, etc. All there. I mean, there's nothing especially radical. Hesiod, you know, in terms of the theogony, right? The, the birth of the gods and the and how culture begins to be framed and then works in days on the uh, on the um, on uh, the metier metis how one develops a practice you know, it's all throughout Hesiod early on this is before you get to the tragedies okay. and the notion of the comedy all that's happening philosophy is on, emerges as the decline Plato and Aristotle are reflecting in yeah. the moment of the decline of the great Athenian city state yeah in a way. Mm -hmm. People from another planet. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my, again, putting prejudice aside, when you go back and you read this stuff. Parallel universe. Yes, it's a, a parallel universe, right? It's amazing. So, unless without that background, and then see how that's translated into the Roman, right? And, and to be able to compare that to other cultures, you're, you're on to something. But today, you're going back to school. There's no school. I mean, you know, it's about it's about training. It's about quote unquote disciplining you for job preparation and to choose some kind of career. They're not the, the curriculum is not built to think. It never really was, except in a few places. Luckily, we had some of that, you know, going on. But it's rather than for you not to think to get with the program, that's what those get with the program. Yes, yeah. if you could do those multiple right. choices, right. that you understand the program. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, I mean, Bakhtin, for example, who was not really a communist, but he's a very smart man, lived in Russia. He used to roll from his dissertation his cigarette paper because he couldn't get cigarette paper to roll. He'd take the revelate in his world and he'd take things off to smoke with cigarettes while he was, you know, during the Stalin, Stalinist period. I mean, the, one of the most interesting books written was the novel is prefigured by the Platonic Dialogue. And then you'd be able to read novels in a different way. Novel as idea, right? You know, novel in, in, in a very different way. So, I mean, these are things that unfortunately are being completely run over by pre-professional and professional training. You know, this key word that's going on out here. Now, I'm not one to defend, quote, liberal arts or whatever that means, because I'm not part... That's another thing. You know, I was thinking about this because I want to think... I'm trying to rethink Orts and Wells. The liberal imagination. What happened here, Jack? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Press hard. Press hard. Okay. The liberal imagination of Trilling. This is the New York Jewish intelligentsia. This was an attempt to keep the liberal arts going in a way, and it was politicized. You know, this is what this imagination has now become. Um, it's better on the other side. Let's try it. Okay. Um, is it the light? Yeah. I don't think it's the line. I can feel it in the uh, in the text. You cleaned it too good. You cleaned it too good. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. I mean, that's better because the light's better. If you want me to just work over here. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Anyway, so th this thing here, this has been transformed into the neoliberal imagination. Okay. You know. Okay. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. No problem. And then just yeah. angle it down. It's still the same. It's the same. Just suck. That's all. Right. Sorry, guys. Right. It's okay. <laughs> so anyway, this is very interesting, and this is going on in the 1950s, right? Alongside the Chicago School of Rhetoric, 
and the great books programs, right? This is all going on simultaneously. The 60s, in a way, threw up open this to critique, right? That we want to read other things too, you know? We want to read The Fire Next Time, Go Tell It on the Mountain, right? right. Sonny's Blues, you know, about his brother, about Baldwin's uh, brother. So, anyway, so there was this kind of, you know, tension that was existing, you know? between, say, the Ralph Ellisons, right, and the liberal imagination, between the James Baldwins and the, and the Richard Wrights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a way, Native Son is a real attack on the liberal imagination and the liberal as, as, as cult figure. And to me, the greatest essay that takes on the liberal is Sartre's The Jewish Question, the anti-Semite and Jew. It's a phenomenological study of bad faith in, in ideas. You know, and how certain things are defended, and how the status quo is is defended at all costs. So this, even though this was quote progressive, right, in terms of thinking, it was progressive in relation to civil rights, maybe in some cases, even to black freedom movements, even in some certainly anti-war at certain times. You know, the Vietnam War. This still did not get to the core, right? <laughs> values, if you will, of thinking and what that would mean in terms of transformation. This was more like acceptance and becoming educated in that acceptance and incremental change. You know? So this became an anti-communist, hard, empirical, liberal, quote, left in a way. This is why Stanley criticizes the nation so much in a certain way. It kind of comes out of this this background, yeah, please. Trilling? Is that what you're Lionel Trilling, yeah. Oh, His Lionel wife was Diana Trilling, who called the Columbia, you live in the area, you know, the shrinking white island. <laughs> she wrote about the demonstrations with Rod and Shapiro and the whole, you know, moment in 68, the taking of, um, what was the name of the president? Uh, Grace and Turk's oh, yeah. uh, office in the, um, in the, in 68. Yeah, anyway, Lionel and Diana Trilling, the New York Jews. Right, and it was like Philip Roth, you know, mm -hmm. Philip Reif. You know, these were all people. The the you know uh, many journals, you know, the Partisan Review became this, even though the Partisan Review was part. So there's a whole culture around this liberal imagination. So just to go back, you know, so people like Zimmel, right, Hilferding, maybe Hilferding was read by the Monthly Review crowd and by people on the left. Was and, he? And, a little bit, a little bit. Yes, yes. Yeah, certainly Sweezy and, um, and um, uh, um, um, Paul Baron knew this uh, very well. But this was dominant, you know, in terms of the education of a generation of literary scholars, to a degree philosophers, sociologists, etc. A book like Philip Slater comes out of this. It's very intelligent, right? But it's not a left book on loneliness, you know, because he doesn't relate loneliness to alienation. The spiritual economic <laughs> alienation. He doesn't really ground it in those kind of Marxian categories, you know? That's a different, different approach. So anyway, this is very important. You know, and you look at the films of the 50s, like Orson Welles' stuff, especially, you begin to see this playing out in the cinema, too, you know? Before we get to, you know, a kind of change in cinema, you know, around, say, a Shirley Clark's The Connection that you're beginning to see different approaches, you know, through, through cinema, yeah? So the, the, the liberal imagination morphs into the neoliberal imagination. We want people who can read and write, but we don't want people who can think, right? Yeah. This is really what corporate America does. A telling moment, David Geffen, Yale Law School, I always remember this, these kind of things, for some strange reason. <laughs> but, you know, Yale is, you know, kind of like the privileged place of deconstruction during the 70s and, you know, et cetera. I mean, maybe Johns Hopkins before, but, but anyway, David Geffen gets 300 people in 1976 or 77 into a class at the business school. 300 people, yeah? This, this was the beginning of the end to me, right? Howard Cosell, the sportscaster, same thing on sports and writing, right? So you no longer have this kind of, you know, rebellious, you know, thing at the at the elite schools. You know, it's kind of like leveled out. And how are we going to reconstruct? How are we going to, you know, maintain the status quo and make it seem like it's progress? You know, in a certain way. Right? 
-hmm. So of course, yeah. And then you have the whole question of mass education, affirmative action, you know, and Hannah Arendt, who's very conservative at one level, why Johnny can't read, you yeah? And that was a call to go back to the great book problem. So this is going on in Colombia, right? In Chicago, where they think they're the gods of the universe, right? <laughs> They're, they're creating the Chicago School of Rhetoric. Wayne Booth, these kind of people there, right? Richard McKeon, the Aristotelian scholar in, um, in, uh, in philosophy there. Of course, Friedman and company, Becker, Gary Becker, on the notion of human capital. You know, you want to talk about? Everybody's going to talk about human capital. This is, this is part of human capital. Hmm. These these phones and this this stuff. This is all Becker going out. And when some was of the, that first used? That term. Seventies. The seventies. Yes, he, early? he's very early. Foucault. Another what about thing the is the term social capital. Not until later. Later, a little bit later. Social space is used by Henri Lefebvre, hmm. though earlier. But social capital not until later. Yes, Pierre Bourdieu. You know, cultural capital and social capital. So you have Bourdieu, but Foucault is the one that kind of breaks this down very beautifully in the book, The Birth of uh, Biopolitics, The Birth of the Biopolitical. He has a very long section on how neoliberalism started. But what I'm trying to do here by just mentioning this, this has a very long tradition. Lewis Hart's The Liberal Tradition in America. Trilling and company and how they became anti-communist, right, <laughs> etc. Very anti-communist. Very. <laughs> very. I mean, big time, but very smart. You know, again, these are highly, well, highly educated. educated people, very good writers, you know, in their way, very immersed in literature, you know, and sitting in people. positions of power. I'm sorry? Establishment people. Yes, definitely yeah. establishment. Yeah, yeah. But educating a whole generation of people that end up educating, you know, some of us or, or at least become part of our, our teachers, or at least in literature and somewhat in philosophy. So um, anyway, so this morphs, if you will, into the neoliberal. So the neoliberal is very imaginative in a certain, I mean, I've been, I've been thinking about this. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I'm totally right. I'm speculating here about this. But it seems to me that neoliberalism's genius in some ways is to open up diversity, multiculturalism, you know? And, and yes, let them read anything they want, from Ruby Fruit Jungle to, you know, um, um, you know, a cruising or, or whatever. Let the, you know, this is what they want. Fine, fine and dandy. At the expense of a previous generation that still had some immersion in the classics. Yeah, in a sense. So this was a work of thing. I mean, it's not that people didn't know how to read, but they weren't reading for thought anymore. They were reading for identity. How about, yeah. on, how about now adding on the next phase where certain topics or certain readings are traumatic, so they should be removed or should be Oh removed. yeah, the trigger works. Yeah, well, yeah. I get this all the time. Yeah. I mean, I'm not yeah. getting in the classroom. Yeah. And if you, outside of the classroom. If you were to present that information, you yeah, were a threat. Of, yes. you're, you become a threat, right? That's right. I, you know, teaching is a threat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, teaching is a, yeah, you're, you're threatening the space. Mm -hmm. I'm told by the union, uh, per new president about a year and a half ago, you know, I don't feel like I'm in a safe space with you. <laughs> this is during a union. <laughs> during a union. Good amount. Uh, can, I, can I just say what he was referring to? What's that? What was, the, what was the reference? What he said? That, what was she. he thinking? Or she? Is that she. Kudinsky? Yeah, she. Was it about the struggle? About it was about we were going to do the vote count, and you would put the ballot in by the library reference desk, which is always manned. And she said, well, I should check with the people if they're willing to do this. I said, they're paid to sit at the desk. What's the big deal? Michael, I don't feel like I'm in a safe space with you. You know, I'm just as radical as you are. Yeah, yeah, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so I have, to, I have to deal with this, you know, going forward. But anyway, but yeah, you know, I didn't, I, I don't attack, uh, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not really stupid so that way. I'm stupid in other ways. How do we lose so much ground? How do we lose that, you know, that's well, that's a great question. Yeah, 50 mean, years of boredom. Like TV stuff. <laughs> no, it's a great question. It's, it really is the mind. It. Listen, I mean, I, I came up during this period, you know, I was a kind of goof off in the beginning, but I became very, very serious when I was a student in Baltimore. And I just saw enormous potential in all of this and the people I was hanging around and it was positive and it was affirmative. And then somehow, you know, at the end of the 70s, you know, the early 80s, the culture completely shifted in many ways. 
and it was the triumph of the, you know, of the Chicago School in economics uh, at one level. It certainly was the triumph, I think, of identity politics, quality of life. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To what extent was it also the triumph of the metric of shareholder value overall? Yes, that, that's true. I mean, that's, that's a good starting point today. Um, you know, the shareholder value. Um, I'll bring an eraser next time, now, Josh. Maybe this will free up. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, shareholder value started to increase significantly in the, uh, in, in the Reagan years, right? So you begin to see this stock market advance. And, you know, as I pointed out, the Chicago Board's Options Exchange Capital was busy at work because the 70s were not a period of economic growth. It was really the terms that were used were stagflation, right, was a, a new economic term. Um, you know, inflation was a constant concern, right? Um, tight money, you know, interest rates were very high. If you bought a house during the 70s, you most likely would pay 12 to 15 percent interest. Well, in that's some because cases, of Volcker, more. the Volcker More, yeah, the Volcker shock. Which also created the third world debt crisis. Yes, indeed, yes, yeah. yeah. So you have, you have all this going on at times, but yes, the, the educated class began to start looking at, you know, and I brought the, the weekend financial presses, you know, they started looking at this, and this became the reading material. The Wall Street Journal, right, the, and the Financial Times, and Barron's, and Investor's Daily Business, you know, started during that period. So you have this whole ideology that started, again, nobody read the Wall Street Journal in the 60s in an active way. I mean, I did because, you know, I looked, I, lo I was looking at markets and, you know, I, you know, I mean, I knew this was just a, a sheet of data that you had to interpret. I mean, this is really what, you, what you're doing. So, um, but anyway, yes, this became a new kind of ideology that was very much there. Fox News, of course, new types of, What know, about the, the whole, spent. like, uh, introduction of the personal narrative and the narrative? Yes, that's part of identity meaning. politics. Yeah, narrative meaning, yeah. I mean, I, we don't have identities, really. If you really think about this existentially and phenomenologically, yeah. the paradox is really the identity is a way of justifying, you know, our existence, but it's not really justifying anything. There's no substantive value to this. Well, the, well the, if you're defined by your praxis, you know, that's a different story, right? You're judged by what you do in the Sartre and Marxian sense. But what about yeah. identity as a site of struggle? That, that's a different story. It's a, right, yeah, that's it's a, a different thing. story. Right, because that's what I see. That was a different I mean, story. That's yeah. where yes. we're coming from, where identity. It's just, yes. you know, according to organize not, around. Yes, but the problem is that politics no longer became a subversive politics. Yeah. This is right. part of the problem. That politics became normalized completely. Just like the multiculturalism, oh yes, we're going to welcome the Muslims in the neighborhood. But it got normalized welcome, yeah. under, through the personal narrative. Right, right. right. And now we're in a situation where we have empirical data that counters those personal narratives and we can't get out from under anybody to be able to see that. Ancestry.com. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, and, I mean, you know, think about this. Everybody's searching for, quote, who am I? Mm. You know, what does it mean? Instead of reconstructing, you know, yeah. one's place, names, you know, etc., through the imaginary and, you know, doing a real praxis about that, now you can push buttons and see, oh, I had a relative here in 1831 or, you know, something, something like that. Or I go back to, you know, in my case, to the second book, line 769 of the Iliad. Right. So I got long, long trace. <laughs> <laughs> this is me, yeah. yeah. right. father of the beautiful yeah. Alcestis. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so I mean, you know, yeah, I hear what you're saying. The side of struggle, and Foucault was very active in that, right? Right, because I we mean, can't. the micro -po political became dominant over the totality. Right, because the personal narrative gets in the way of struggle now, because the personal narrative gives rise to this idea of identity politics, as you you were talking about it before, ver versus side of struggle, right? So, yes. so in the side of struggle, we have where people coming out producing empirical data that counter, right. uh, you know, contradicts the the personal narrative, and we can't get out people to understand and mobilize around the actual lived experiences of the group rather than the idea of the individual. You know? right. 
in, in all it's, of this, to my mind, what was lost was class analysis. And class right, right, exactly. And the force. Right. There's well, no a class analysis as class, as yes. gender, as sex, as well, class, as, as, as age. Class, class as, as movement, not especially just haves and have-nots or the old economic categories of the oppressor and the oppressed, but class is movement. movement. What's lost is, you know, early moments of feminism is liberating. Right, first and second wave feminism, rather than third and whatever so the fourth wave is going to be. We want our place in the marketplace, exactly. and that's what it's about. The it's not about identity or transformation or change anymore. Right, disability movement is also part of a class thing. You know, how do you basically take care of of people with disabilities? The Black Freedom Movement was a class position. It wasn't only a race. You know, it was about a class. Yeah, about a class, class struggle, in many ways. So you can begin to look at these move, movements as part of class too, not just as a fixed category, but as a category that is fluid, is, is subject to vicissitudes, changes, you know, and, and reconceptualization always. Right, but not purely an economic idea of class. No, right. certainly not. Right. Okay. No, no, yeah, okay. no, no, okay. no, 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 no. No. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between the gay culture in the West Village and the gay culture in, you know, in Iowa. In Washington Heights or in yeah, Iowa. Yeah, right? yeah right. Exactly. Just even in New York yeah. City, you can see the, the differences, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and you can see that in terms of, you know, people that live in the suburbs who are affluent versus the people that live, you know, in downtown in Tribeca. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a different kind of class, class relations, right. different kinds of everyday life. And also the everyday life, now the descriptive and the analytical in that has also been lost because it's about one's trauma it's about one's identity and how one is traumatized. So what's been created, at least in my mind, and again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I think one of the worst things that the left has participated is the politics of victimhood. Mm -hmm. I think it's destroyed action, praxis, and you know, practical reason. It's a new and thing, so, huh? It's a new thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I never experienced that early on with no. people I hung out with. You were just ready I to seize like power. Like the last <laughs> Let's 20, take the power. Last you know, 20 years, right? Very, last 20, 15 yeah, to 20 yeah, years? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't feel like I'm in a safe space. Yeah. Where do remarks like this come from? Because a safe space was a political safe space. space. Is a, yeah. It was like women organized in a safe space for women to organize, or gay people organized in a space right. that was right. safe for them to organize, right? Yeah. That's what it was. It was, a, it was a political right. you know, strategy. So in some ways, I'm being very general yeah, here, but in some yeah. ways, you know, the Foucaultian notion of the micro-political, and you struggle at sight, right, was in conflict very much with class analysis. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, uh, knock Foucault here at all, mm -hmm. but what it did is it displaced, in some ways, by the scholars and right, the people right. that used it, the class analysis. Mm -hmm because he didn't bring class back into it, whereas in the Sartrean moment, class was always there. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the battle, theoretically, in France between the Sartrean factions of the praxis from the critique of dialectical reason to, to Foucault's new micro-practices. Do you think his analysis is at odds with the class analysis? I think, I think it's been taken up as such. I'm not so sure I'd have to reread a lot of his stuff on knowledge and power uh, I mean, he certainly is well enough aware of the knowledge has a class element to it, right? He's very well aware of that and how power is used, uh, etc. But he's more interested in the questions of power and power relations, which have no center, versus that of class. So you have this opposition that's created between class and power. A dialectical opposition, maybe a healthy tension too, and the people at York University, capitalist power, Nitsan and them, or Beckler, are doing work. They, they read capital as class and power, capital as power. So they're taking a Foucaultian approach with a Marxian, you know, problematic. It's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just wondering if we're gonna. Yeah, we're gonna go. Yeah, yeah. I know you have to go at three uh, thirty, right? Yeah. 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 And, and Rachel, so three twenty. The, the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Matter. We're gonna do this one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The heart. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I mean, look, I, I think we should be aware of these things uh, as we go go forward. You know, in, in some ways. And I mean, in the um, past, we've spent a lot of time. We, we read Foucault. Remember? We yes. Right? Yes, we did. And I mean, the birth of the biopolitical is one of his best book yeah. lectures because it actually gives you great insight into how neoliberalism, what we use as neoliberalism, was born. And how now, no longer are we only dealing with 
you know, capital in terms of class labor capital relations. We're dealing with capital as biopower. And you know, the, the new structure in some ways, uh, you know, at least in the medical regime, right, is basically the thanatology, right, the study of death, right, and looking at the death drive and how do you work this into, you know, everything from big pharma, hospitals, how things are being constructed, the architecture, et cetera, et cetera, and, and population control, et cetera, how does this feed epidemiology uh, uh, programs, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I, I think this is very important to, to keep in mind. And, you know, the derivative market also, you know, gets into this. We'll get into that later, you know, when we get, you know, closer to the derivatives. Okay, so I wanted to go back, uh, just to go back to Hilferding for a sense. You know, we, we did last uh, last time, and I think it was, what, early June, about uh, three weeks ago, uh, before they left forum, mm -hmm. right? Uh, late May, then, you know. Uh, uh, we did, uh, you know, the joint stock company, but I wanted to go back to the diagram that uh, Josh uh, uh, pointed out. And this is on page, um, it's seven. early, it's in chapter seven, yeah. it's figure one, and it's about four pages in, four, six pages in, right. and 113 in the text, right? So anyway, turning now to the particular form which the circulation of fictitious capital takes, we find the following, and this is basically the movement of the stock exchange. The shares, S, and if you look at figure one on the bottom of the page, S, right, moves, that is, sold for money, M, you can see M there, right, S to M at the top, right, that movement to M2 and to M1, and one part of the money in constitutes the promoter's profit. Now, Zimmel claims that Marx never factored in the promoter's profit in his equations. Um, you know, say the issuing bank and drops out of circulation in the cycle. So with Goldman Sachs on an IPO, so let's say for a startup pharmaceutical with some kind of designer drugs, right? Is in the new cancer experimentation or something like that, is part of the promoter profit that you never see, right? Going into the stock exchange. But the other part, right, M1 is converted into productive capital. We'll get pay our people, we'll build our factories, we'll build our research facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And enters the cycle of indulgence, which is always familiar to us. The shares have been sold, if they are circulating yet, then additional money is needed as a medium of circulation. So maybe the company did not get enough in its IPO, right, its initial public offering, so it has to do another round of this, and you can see in the diagram, one goes down, right, M2, back to S, right, right, and the S again is the shares, and the stock exchange is that equation on figure one, reading vertically from the top S to M2 to S, right, that's what the stock exchange does. That's that extra amount of money that goes beyond the promoters, right? <laughs> right? Profit and the conversion, right, into productive capital. So it's excess capital, right? Excess capital that forms the, the, the stock exchange. This circulation, right? SM2S takes place in the specific market, what I just said, the stock exchange. That's the schema. Okay, so once a share has been is issued, what uh, Beth referred to as shareholder value, or you know now everything's called stakeholder capitalism, right? Instead of shareholder capitalism, maybe shareholder capitalism was a was a phrase used maybe 20, 30 years ago, but today it's the stakeholder, right? <laughs> this plays out has been issued it has nothing more to do with the real cycle of the industrial capital that it represents. So it has completely been divorced, and this is Hilferding's argument, that somehow finance capital itself, right, the money economy, right, and finance capital and bank capital has a world of its own, has a logic of its own, right, outside of the making of industrial goods and services, right, or industrial cycle, okay? So this is a separation that's going on, industrial capital and, and, and finance capital. And Both, yeah, please. Yeah. profit is kind of the formation of the uh, kind of 
capitalist oligarchy. It's it's a kind of a, a formalization yeah. in which you get a, a profit. So Goldman Sachs, for example, say you have a hundred million dollar offering uh -huh. of new client shareholder value in the IPO. It's going to take you know two to three percent of that in order to put it out right. there. The promoter's profit. At the same time, the banks are now doing this too. Right. Who's going to get the money? You know, so the, this is part of the Glass-Steagall, the repeal of the right. Glass-Steagall Act that allowed the investment banks to become part of the bank capital process. Why a, a firm like Goldman Sachs could go grow so rapidly, and they can thank no wonder Robert White Clinton. came from there. Clinton, I knew you were going to say that. You know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you kind of understand <laughs> how this is working yeah. in terms of the law, right? Yeah. And the legislative body alongside uh, the capital body. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're they're working always constantly together, right? So Glass Steagall, that repeal was essential to this new moment of the the great leap forward, if you will, of you know shareholder value. And essential to the crash of 07. And essential to the crash of 07, and essential to the crash of the of uh, you know maybe two thousand and one, the dot com bubble too. Everybody had a startup, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. What's so the next crash. Um, I don't think I, I don't think that that's going to happen right now. I mean, I, I think you know, problem. You know, there's an old joke about Marxists. They predicted 35 of the last two crashes. Right. crashes right? <laughs> like that. I'm exaggerating, but you know, that's kind of the thing. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, you know, in a, in a way, let me just say this. I don't think we're really in, in an, have an ability to be so predictive. I mean, I think you can see signs. You know. I mean, there's a lot of over speculation. There's a lot of overbought, and I'll go over this when we do, you know, quote what's called technical analysis. How you read bar graphs and charts, and how certain stocks will be oversold or overbought, and you know, etc. I think we're in a very overbought situation, which may provide what they call on Wall Street a correction, which means shareholder value goes down 10%. Really, not really the value, the capitalization is going down 10%. I meant like about the deregulation that's going on just recently of the banks. Well, that favors the banks. I mean, again, I mean that's the new glass. That's basically, you know, Dobbs Frank was too. Dobbs Frank was too. Uh, too extreme for us. In fact, it was totally mild and didn't address the problem. But now it's too extreme to show you how far. So I mean, Nixon is a, is a raving <laughs> leftist where we are today. I mean, Richard Nixon. I, you know, I'm saying this. But what do you think the implications will be of, of, of the situation now? Going well, forward, I mean, the banks, the banks are, you know, uh, the banks are in collusion with the Fed. I mean, you know, it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's. Yeah, I mean the ba the banks got a free ride out of this 2007 crisis. You know the phrase he even uses it here at the end of. I'll give you the page. It's at the end of chapter eight. Exactly what uh, we, uh, right, right. Uh, we would say. No, but and page 180. He says right. it socializes other people's money by use by the few. Right. You know, you privatize the profits and you socialize the losses. Right. That's the slogan. Here he is, 1910, already knowing this, and he says it. It socializes other people's money for use by the few. At the outset, it suddenly opens up for the knights of credit, the knights of credit, right? Prodigious vistas, the barrenness to the capitalist production, private property seem to have fallen, and the entire productive power of society appears to be placed at the disposal of the individual. And we'll look at this in terms of Zimmel, too. This is a very good thing. Um, the prospect intoxicates him, and in turn, he intoxicates and swindles others. So this is, you know, yeah, very interesting, you know, that you have capital as addictive, capital as power, you know, and then how it's used by the few. And this, you know, I mean, what happened in 2007 and 2008? The big banks were taken out. You know, you know the slogan, yeah. too big to fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the slogan. And you basically, I mean, you know, the three-year-old and the E-Trade commercials can make money if you go to the discount window. Oh, thank you for my bag of money. I can loan this now at 30% to the poor, 5% to my best customers. Wow, I didn't know yeah, such profits. Were rocket, so. You know, you know, you know what I mean? And yeah, in a certain absolutely. way, that is the basic. Yeah. That is the, really the basic, you know, in, in, in some ways of what was happening. The problem today, when you ask the question about a crash, I mean, yes, a crash could be imminent given all of this paper out there yeah. in fictitious capital where you have credit default swaps still, collateralized debt obligations, all these forms 
that have been written since, you know, in the last decade or longer. Like the uh, Masters, uh, I think, began in 1995 with credit default swaps. You know, she's kind of the, you know, the brainchild of this. Um, um, so we're 23 years into this kind of new types of collateralized debt obligations and default swaps, right? So if Josh and Rachel default on their house, someone is going to make money on that default, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. First challenge. Right. Right. I got you. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. So, so I mean, anyway, this is this is what you know. Sort of. So, when you ask this question, there. I mean, I don't know the exact figures, but I've heard anywhere from six hundred uh, trillion all the way up to a zillion dollars of paper floating out there. I think Nomi Prinz is very good on this. Yeah. She's very good because she worked in the industry. She has a new she book. Does this. She does it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have you read? No, it just came out. Yeah, yeah. She moved to the West Coast, unfortunately. Yeah, anyway. But she spent the past couple of years talking to central bankers. Right, right. So, yeah, she's very good at this empirically, you know? I mean, the question is theoretically, how is this working? You know, right. what's going on? And you know, you have to think of this as it's such a high level of abstraction because there's no claim on industrial yeah. profit here, or industrial capital, or real things that we see. There's also no dependence on private property. <laughs> you know, you're talking about a floating, you know, money game, if you will, out there that is brought to you by a coalition of central bankers and bankers that are always, you know, playing this out, and investment banking houses, which are, you know, just as powerful as the banks. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you know Jamie Dimon knows the head of Goldman, <laughs> Lloyd Lloyd Blankstein, they probably pay bridge together. You know, they probably pay, uh, uh, what do they call that game, back end, you know, or whatever. Like, like, like Gates and uh, um, Buffett play, you know. Yeah, yeah. Bridge, the street. bridge, bridge together. Bridge is good for the mind, though. You learn how to, you know, trump, right, <laughs> <and> bridge. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So, um, all to say, again, this diagram is important because it shows you, again, how divorced this is from industrial capital. And then the movement into M1 commodity, right? And that relationship is the old relationship of commodity and labor. But then you have the profit into commodity one, which goes back around again to money two, right? Which is, you know, the M2 as a moment of circulation. So you're really dealing here with a sphere of circulation that is completely separate, if you will, from industrial uh, uh, capital, right? So he's going to go, yeah. So this is very important to me. The stock exchange, this thing that, you know, you look at these market data papers, you're reading basically a whole fiction here. And I also recommend reading Jeremy Bentham's Theories of Fictions, which is very interesting because, you know, the London Stock Exchange was operated at that time. Bentham is the, you know, the English philosopher yeah. who wrote the Panopticon, you know, at which Foucault, you know, based part of it. I think Discipline and Punishment is a, basically a long dialogue with Otto Kirchheimer of the Frankfurt School on um, uh, uh, what's it called, Capital and Punishment. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the 1932 piece with Foucault somewhere investigating that and also a long discourse with Hobbes. But obviously Bentham's there in terms of the Panopticon. So this, for example, this oh, uh, Panopticon and the theory of fictions, theory of fictions, right? So, you know, when you look at these tables, once again, the Markets Digest, the thing, <laughs> in order to give any meaning to this, you have to understand that this is at the highest level, you know, of abstraction away from both private property, anything tangible, industrial profit, you know, and capital, et cetera. In fact, this has nothing to do with value at all, even though it's what, you know, again, dominates, right? <laughs> dominates constantly. It's interesting. Yeah, nothing to do with real value. There's no substantive value here, as we'll see in, you know, in a way. Right? Even though this, this represents, this page here, just this page here is representing multiple trillions of dollars, right? That are going all, all the time, right? 
and you know they're at least at least in the United States between the th the, the major exchanges close to 4,500 publicly traded com corporations, mm. right, on these exchanges. That does not include the smaller ones that aren't listed or don't, you know, play out actively. So I have like a, a marijuana stock where they play middlemen, leaf buy technologies. They do, uh, you know, dope connections by uh, internet. <laughs> and you're not, you're not even referring to the bond funds there, right? No, I'm not talking to the bond funds. Just This is just the equities. Yeah. Yeah, just the equity, equity funds, yeah. <laughs> so again, you know, you see the color spectrum, like for children, right? <laughs> you know, you get the green, the blue, you know, these are the advances up here, how well they did, and then the declines. You know, and you can see the decline down here of um, the um, uh, soybeans was the greatest loss of the week, whereas the best of the week was the natural gas. Hmm. So, yeah. So next week you're going to pay more for gas, right? I thought it would have been pork bellies because of the trade wars getting up. Well, no, soybeans are huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're right. You're close to the pork. Pork bellies are on the list, but they're a little higher up. Yeah. The Mexican peso had a bad week. These are, you can get the depressed list here and the active list. Yeah, but Mexico just beat Germany in the World Cup. Folks. Yes, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> right, right. Right. So, um, yeah, so you begin in the Canadian dollar, you know? Uh, uh -oh. Luis was able to spend good money up there in America. So, the, the, what's the exchange rate? Right, <coughs> right, 76 cents for the U.S. dollar, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it took out a little extra. Yeah. <laughs> it wins up Yeah, it wins uh, one on that one, yeah, so to speak. So, anyway, yes, and what Beth was saying, then you have the bonds, which is your debt. You know, this is creating, quote unquote, shareholder value and what's called market capitalization. We'll talk more about that term, you know, as we go further in, but how things are capitalized. But a, a very central, say a, a company has 100 um, million shares outstanding, right? And it sells for $35 uh, a share, right? The market capitalization is 100 million times this 35, right? So you're up to 350, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, three point five billion dollars worth of market capitalization. That that market capitalization, it's just, it's just literally fictitious. I mean, well, it is. Who yeah. could, if that debt came due, nobody could generate that. But again, this is this is happening on a very well regulated, balanced exchange, yeah. in which I'm the guy that says, Beth, I'm going to sell you a uh, million shares of uh, Amazon at 1,600 a share. You know, will you take it? And you notice that the Amazon's at 1,601. Oh man, I make a great deal here. So you take it. Then another guy comes along and he says, I'm gonna sell one million <laughs> shares. And you say to that, oh, I'll give it to you for 1,602 a share. So this is very active and it's going on through machines constantly. They're mathematically programmed to keep an ebb and flow to keep this structured in such a way that you don't get a tremendous imbalance or what would create a quote-unquote liquidity crisis. I'm so, reading yeah. um, this book, a recent book called Black Edge, which is about the pursuit of Stephen Cohen and the SAC hedge fund. Uh -huh. That's, it's, it's, he got um, off, right? He's out he of jail. totally got yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, he didn't get off his divorce. So. Right, well, that, that always happens. Yeah. But it's really interesting <laughs> because it's it's a look inside the hedge funds. Yes, yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah, so, so, but this is what a market capitalization means. I mean, you know, the, that you multiply that times the price of the stock. So right now the highest uh, market capitalization, I think, is Apple, is almost $1 trillion, just as one corporate entity. And this doesn't really, this isn't really about debt. This is about what could be due, right, in terms of price manipulations and actions. That market capitalization could go up and down. But you're not indebted because of market capitalization. You're indebted when you pay yields, dividends. Another criticism that Zimmel has of Marx, he doesn't really understand or doesn't factor yield into you know, his formulas for capital in the sphere of uh, circulation. So the bonds, but bonds are ways of creating debt, right? 
I promise to pay you in 30 years at 5% a year, you know, $100 million. You know, I'm trying to raise the $100 million for right now. I will pay back the principal maybe three, four times because of the interest. That's the yield. So then you have ratings on these bonds, which range from AAA to junk to C minus or whatever, you know. And this is what the rating agencies do, and as most of you know, they were also complicit in the 2007 because they inflated the value of a lot of bound bonds and let a lot of things go go by through the lives just glazed over. This is all right, we represent. They inflated, this is, they inflated the value of the, the, the bonds, right, in terms of rating, great inflation. Great, right. great inflation now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Moody, Standard and right. Poor's, etc. How and much then, is the bond market, um, the public offerings of bonds, municipal bonds, well, you can get corporate cities, yeah, corporates, yeah, you can get, yeah, yeah. They have corporate bonds and they also are rated, so you're better off buying, you know, this is how corporations sometimes find, fund new programs. So I, I study micron technology very, very closely. One of the reasons I think, I think it's the commodity form of the semiconductor industry, which is essential for the use of all these, you know, this is the memory chip, or this chip. It's called DRAM, you know, dynamic random access memory, and how they have something called NAM, too. They have new factories they're building. Anyway, in studying this company, I see that the bonds themselves, that the, the debt that they put out there, they're paying X amount of interest, but every time they, the stock goes up, and the stock has gone up from $9.60 three summers ago to about 59 now, right, which is a huge, you know, increase, right? I mean, that's good return on money, on capital, 9,000 equals 59 in three years' time. Um, they'll buy back some of that stock, right, and then they'll take that extra money when they, after they buy back that stock and the market capitalization goes up, they'll, they'll pay off their bonds, pay off higher interest. So you have this rotation of where, oh, we wrote bonds at 8% back in the day, but today we can go out and borrow at 5%. So let's retire the bonds at 8%. And of course, most of you know in the credit card industry, you know, you get these things in the mail all the time, retire your, your excessive credit card debt. Well, that's the same thing that has been going on in corporations for a very long time on a micro, a personal level, right? Yeah, you can pay off your 11% credit cards with a loan at 6%. And then you do the calculations, I'm going to save 5% of interest a year by doing this. You know, I, I save X amount of dollars that you, they're going to go, that they know very well you're going to spend. You're not going to save it. You know, this is the biggest argument for student loan forgiveness, that that money would go back into the economy. That's something Wall Street could understand. Yeah. Not just, you know, cancel it out. Right. But cancel it out with a reason but if you cancel that out, just think what this kids are, kids are going to do with the extra two hundred to four hundred dollars a month, right? Where they're going to go out and spend it. Right. So, so bond bond markets are part of the debt the debt debtor economy, you know, et cetera. And municipal bonds, as you know, are tax free, right? At least in the states, they're issued, right? Not always, uh, you know. Uh, not always at the state level, if you're buying California bonds, you may have to pay New York taxes on, on those, uh, those kind of bonds. But then there are bond funds, there are bond municipal funds. There's PIMCO, you know, huge mutual fund, you know, another trillion dollars. Does PIMCO dollar. also have the tax exempt munis? Yes. Oh, it does. Day. So they're all bundled together, the yes. corporate bonds and the munis. Well, they're bundled together under uh, an overarching corporate name. But they're separate managers right. and they're separate attempts. So in the municipals, if you can get four percent, you're doing very well, and you protect your principal. If you're doing five, five and a half in the corporate, you're doing well, and they have different managers doing this. And then you're going to buy the Mexican debt with a lower peso. These are the kind of things they sit at the table and do in the morning, you know, to analyze. Well, the Mexican peso is this, 
what kind of Mexican bonds do we have available to us? What can we buy with our U.S. dollars? So this is where the currency markets are also going in. And a, a hedge fund manager is going to look at the currency markets and say the dollar to the peso is X, you know. I'm going to try to play this as well and hedge my bonds by buying the peso against the U.S. dollar, even though I'm spending a much more valuable dollar to buy their debt. You see, I mean, they're, they're, these are the decisions that they're making on a daily basis. And a lot of times they're wrong because they're not making great money. I mean, this year, this is an amazing thing. But this is how you put yourself in the mind of the speculator that he's going to say, okay, they're paying 12% on Mexican bonds because there may be a leftist uh, government soon. Right? Yeah? They're worried about this. Uh, a friend of mine from Paris right. is going to be part of the uh, election uh, committee that's going to both be an observer. Jim Cohen from uh, Paris, sociologist. But anyway, he's, he's going. So they look at this and they say, okay, we can get 12% on this money right here. And the peso is very low too. So we're actually using U.S. dollars. If the peso goes up, and the return may be even more than 12%. Because you're going to have a currency move back up if the Mexican government, or you buy it, you know, you short it, thinking that the leftist government's going to make a mess. And those bonds are going to go down in price. The more the bond goes down in price, the more its yield goes up. So if a hundred, a thousand dollar face value a bond goes from a thousand to nine hundred, you lose ten percent of your principal. But that yield, if you're buying at nine hundred, is going to be much greater than the coupon rate at five percent at one thousand. It's going to go up much more, right? You know, you're going to be making it back on the interest. So all of these, these calculations and fluctuations are happening on a daily basis. But, but again, you're right. I mean, the, the, the bonds, the municipal bonds, you're right, go to productive purposes. You know, you get public works, educational programs, building programs, infrastructure, etc. cetera, right? Um, and, um, um, but, you know, in terms of the corporate bonds, it's a way of refinancing, Right? In a way, it becomes part of fictitious capital in that element of finance capital, rather than, you know. So GMAC, for example, can offer 0% interest for four years when you buy a car. Right? So because can of you, could yeah. you put corporate bonds right, um, I'm trying to visualize, yeah. corporate bonds right next to corporate equities. So with corporate bonds, they're selling debt, and with corporate, with, with equities, they're selling a claim on future profits. Exactly. That's well put. It. Yes. Okay. Yeah, in a very basic sense, yes. And and also think about it this way You're too. You're financing them up front with the corporate bonds. Yes. You're taking on their debt. You become a real stakeholder. You're purchasing their debt. Yeah, yeah. You're taking on part of their debt. Yes, by purchasing their debt. Yes. Yes. And you have to worry, are they going to be able to pay you the yield? Will they default? And then there are programs of default, too, where certain types of preferred <laughs> shares, right, if a company goes bankrupt or are taken and given to the stockholders, or other, other, you know, part of that debt is not. Just like in bankruptcy court, sure. in a certain way, you know? Isn't there a whole different risk calculation for corporate bonds versus equities? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're valuing the ability of the corporation to pay the yield, not especially pay back the whole amount of the bond. Can the corporation that puts out a billion dollars pay the, the 50 million a year in interest? They don't really care about the principal. That's already mathematized well into the future. It seems like a little they're more risk. interested. Yeah, yeah. Hurt. <laughs> yeah the interest, right? Yeah. yeah, they're interested in the interest, the yield on that investment. So bonds really, the first thing to look at in terms of the bonds, in, in a way, is always what is the yield and what is the rating on that bond. Now a lot of these bonds would not, uh, you know, be rated the way they were by Price, Waterhouse, Moody, Standards and Poor's, etc. Mm -hmm. back in 2007 and 2008. So it's much more careful than that. Yeah. What, Rachel? What? I, I mean, it's kind of slightly aside. Question. Yeah, yeah, sure. When a company um, becomes publicly traded, how do they like come up with these figures and share? Huh? Go ahead. So. Well, I'm just curious how, how exactly it's done. Well, I mean, you, you go in and you say, you know, I want to start a, a fashion boutique. 
Yes. And my needs are, you know, $50 million over the next five years for, you know, operating budget, capitalization of, uh, you know, factory employees, et cetera, you're going with that. And they usually will tell you at the investment banking house, you might get, you're gonna probably need more. So we're gonna issue, you know, this corporation, Rachel Scott's, you know, fashion boutique at, um, uh, we're gonna capitalize it at 100 million. And we're gonna offer, you know, 5 million shares in an IPO at $20 a share. And of that 100 million, we'll take our promoter's profit, right? 2%, so they get 2 million up front for just giving you the advice I just gave you. Right? <laughs> and, you know, anyway, I mean, in a basic sense, I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna do the paperwork and go through all the regulations, of course, it's fine, it's involved. And then the remaining 98 million will go to you, you know, in a sense, as operating capital, but that's happening through a market, right? It's happening in the market. Now you have shareholders to whom you're quote unquote beholden, which you're not really, because if you're smart, you're gonna say, I want 20 million shares for myself. I mean, if you're smart in a capitalist sense, right? You know, you're going to want to say, I want 20 million shares of the float. I want to own 20% of the company. So, so, so you issue the stock, let's say you issue the stock, it's 100 million shares at, uh, I mean, 20 million shares at uh, $5 a share, right? And you hold 20%, 4 million shares at $5 a share. Say the stock goes to $9 because of your name, which is a very big possibility. You know, you know if you do Jennifer Lawrence dresses or something like that, I mean, I'm not you know, playing here, but, but anyway, the, the, the name, the name recognition may increase. It's not real substantive value, but it is fictitious value that's added to this. But if you're a speculator, you say, wow, this is going to fly. Let's get on this. And you pick up through a brokerage house or a company, you pick up a million shares as a hedge fund. And you say, OK, at $5 a share, we bought it. We can sell it at nine two days later. That's a nice little tidy. You know, 80% profit, you know, four-fifths on your money in a few days, just on the initial public offer. You as an officer and a participant in the company are probably bound by certain rules that you can only share, sell a certain amount of shares of your, your own stock, mm -hmm. right? Exactly, right? This is why people look very actively at insider trading mm -hmm. statistics. Who's buying within the company, who's selling? Right? Then you have to read between the lines. Is this someone that may need money while they had to dump 20,000 shares? Or is it someone that's anticipating mm -hmm. a decline in the earnings potential mm -hmm. or the claims on the future profits, which will bring down, quote unquote, the price of the stock? So how do they get that sort of information, that sort of insider information? A million different ways? That's or? what this book is about. Oh, okay. yes. that's, that's, yeah, yeah. 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 They have codes. A discreet phone call. Yes. Yeah. A friend of a friend. Hi, Beth. <laughs> Bye, Chris, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. just a tip yeah. Did you hear Chris? Chris is not company. well. You know, listen, you know, I don't know. What, what hospital is she going? What's the name of that hospital again? Oh, that's a publicly training company. Yeah. Or someone in the lab. Tip right. someone out. Yeah, tip off someone that outside. There's a bad clinical trial right. on, Coming on up. a new block. Short and like crazy. Short it. Right, right. Exactly. Back to the yeah. example you used with 20 yeah. million shares. Yeah. Is that 20 million number also a float number? That's what That becomes part of the market capitalization and how many shares are floated. Right. Yes. So you can, yes. like, potentially sell 40 million shares. Or have no, no. The 20 million shares, you have to redo this again to add the other 20 oh, so, million. Okay, to get to okay, okay, so, yeah. This is right. just, I mean, of course, I know it's all fictitious, but the, the amounts of shares and the value is completely arbitrary. It's not completely arbitrary. It's based on future expectations. Right, right. This like, is all based on, you know, listen, to use Heideggerian language, yeah. anticipation. Right. It's temporal anticipation and possibility of you being a major success. Right. And people are be betting way. on you that you're going to be able to produce the bottom line, you know, for them 
but mm. not based on like this company, but based on other similar companies. I'm just like really curious. Well, they would base it. They would look at how the market. Yes, oh, of course. Okay. The comparisons would start. How did so and so do? How does this stack up against Ralph Lauren? Right, right, right. How does this okay. stack up against you know so and so okay. Saks Fifth Avenue? Or they'll go to the retail level. They'll go to the designer level. Tommy Hilfiger, whatever. I mean, yeah. you know, all these kind of things. Yeah. yeah. So they're going to value it somewhere in that ballpark. But if they think your name recognition is more, or that it's in the air, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people who think through this psychologically. Oh man, everybody wants to be a part of this new new craze, mm -hmm. this new kid on the block, so to speak, they're going to, you know, say, okay, it's valued higher mm -hmm. than Ralph Lauren in the beginning because of the anticipation. So you have to think of this always in a level of expectational right. analysis and expectational temporality, right? Very, very important. Yeah. Two questions. Yeah, sure. So is it the case that you can run out of shares to sell? We no. can get to 20 because million. You can go back to Goldman Sachs or Nomi Prince when she was there. Okay, but then if you go. another 500 million. But if you, you know, add another 10, more, 10 million shares, say if you want to add a 10, more, 10 million more shares. Because yeah, you sorry, sold to the dilute. Dilute, dilute. Okay, okay yeah. But then you go back into the company and say, well, maybe the company's worth even more, so. Yes, I mean, it depends on what, what it is. If you right, start, you say, right. I'm going to offer another. Rachel says, I don't have enough working capital. So she two. goes to her person at, at Goldman or Morgan Stanley or at, um, you know, wherever, uh, Citicorp. Or, you know, and she says, I need another, you know, 20 million for an expansion of a plant. You know, I can exploit some Nicaraguan and right. uh, Honduran workers there better. I know a factory I can use, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, they start thinking this through and they say, okay, we're going to float a secondary offering after the primary offering, you know, of another X amount of dollars. So instead of your share value being at, say, she capitalized, you know, what, what did they say? It was and 100 million. 100 million? Yeah. It's going to go to 200 million. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, but the 200 million now may bring down the price of the stock a little bit. Right. Because it's diluted because of more shares on the market. And then the expectation is still that she has to make a profit, right? And what will that profit look like? But so is this is that intertwined. Money going into her business for her to yes. open yes. stores. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exploit yes. It goes to operating. China, yeah. She you know? gets 40 it's million out of the 200 it's million. It's operating capital. How does like let's say they say this company's worth 100 million. No, they don't say it. No, the market says it. Okay. The market, the market is speaking here. Okay. <laughs> Where how? You know, remember, like <laughs> this is so abstract. Yeah, yeah. Just think of me. I'm speaking this <laughs> up. So the company, yeah. the Oracle of Omaha. Yeah. <laughs> but officially, yeah, right. so the company only real in reality has in the old model, which is what fashion is, has 20 million. But now the market says it's worth 100 million. But then the promoter's profit or whatever, they immediately get this two percent of the hundred million. So where the hell does that twenty million come from? It but comes from people like us who exactly. say, "I want to buy." So when we a, buy, a piece that's of when they Rachel Scott's okay. business. Okay. But I wonder if that I want to buy a piece of this okay. business. I, I wonder yeah. if that's I wonder if that's the market because it's not really the market because if you look at the VC funders funding tech companies. And Rachel needed twenty million dollars, and they're going to say that twenty million dollars is really capitalization, market capitalization of hundred million dollars. They're giving you twenty million dollars, issuing shares, mm -hmm. and saying to the market, basically, this is what we think the price of the company or the value of the company. I, I don't know which word to use without getting no, it's price. Saying, it's not about okay. The of the company of like hundred million dollars. Yeah, so yeah. when the IPO opens up, yeah. they're thinking, oh, yeah. Facebook is going to be Look. worth yeah, right. Let me, let me just do this, and people okay. buy. Based on that, but then right. we can either go dip or Again, come down based the, on that. The future it earnings starts are something. always part of the fictitious. Right. right. The price itself on the market is anticipating the future earnings. Right. So initially, so the, there's a price that they say it's it, it's worth, and the market later on, maybe a day later, the market two weeks says, later. "Wow, Rachel's got a, a fashion boutique." We'll correct it. either we up know or down. about it. We got to start bidding. I want a piece of this. Five dollars. I'm going to pay six twenty-five. Right. The right. next guy, six fifty. I want to be in this. So the yeah, herd, yeah, yeah. the herd starts 
to come in, in a way, mm -hmm. and it's called the, the greater fool theory. There's always a greater fool born. There's a sucker born. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Yeah, so this, this becomes yeah, part of the, yeah. the scheme that plays out. Now, the question then is if there's no earnings, say five years down the road, and the stock, which was issued at $5, goes down to two, well, they right, because it's not fulfilling its promise, or fulfilling the expectations of the initial public offering or the initial buzz around that, you know, you have you have a, the price is going to go down. But you can, right? and the share value, you know, value is evaporating. But you can you can save that by dumping more money into it and reevaluating the company. But you might only be able to get two dollars a share. Of that. But because if you is think about things I'm like saying? Amazon, yeah. has you're not going to be able to offer out ten dollars a share. Of yeah, yeah. Just be careful because the toilet seat's broken. Okay. I forgot to. Yeah. Because Amazon hasn't turned a profit, but a but they keep getting infusions of capital. Well, yeah, Amazon is right, the right. bank's dream. Right. It's bank capital's dream. It's the best wet dream bank capital right. ever had. In what? Way? I mean, in the in the sense that it doesn't need to make a profit in order to be extremely valuable. And you know, be able to because own that it's, it's on the Amazon thing. stock. You're going to buy Amazon stock on today's uh, prices at three dollars a share and, and cashed out at seventeen hundred. You know, I mean, that's you know, all because of this possible. Yeah, future. the future earnings, and at the same time, they keep getting capital infusions into Amazon right. because the model is working. There's a belief in the model, it? and they'll finance. Yeah, what did you call it? The fool's what? Greater, greater, greater fool. fool. Oh, the greater, greater fool. fool. Greater fool. The greater <laughs> fool theory. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, I, I heard about this Rachel yeah. Scott. It's going to be a great design. By the way, it's a good design. name, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I was, well, we can come up with that. I'm being very basic. I actually spent that. three <laughs> years. My imagination is sort of elsewhere. I actually spent three years in the tech um, yeah. internet sort of like. Yeah world for a while because yeah. I was working on um, a startup as well. Okay. So this is stuff they were trying to teach us. Okay. I kept looking at them going, okay. none of it makes any sense to me. I was thinking, how, no one's turning a profit. <laughs> but they right. keep dumping money but into yeah, it. But the question is the yeah. future. I mean, it's Beth knows yeah. this in like terms it. of designer drugs. Right. You know, there's so many little small startup pharma companies. Theranos. Yeah, yeah, Theranos is one. She, she loves these uh, <laughs> ugly <laughs> stories. Uh, <laughs> them. It's great. From Stephen Cohen to Theranos. I can't stand that one. <laughs> I can't She's, believe anyone she, ever gave her a gave nickel. Her a nickel. Yeah. Well, they did. They gave her much more than a nickel. She that's why I'm promoting Rachel. <laughs> but it could go either that's way. The, that's the right? perfect story. That's the perfect, perfect example, example of how that world is. Or it could be a it's really who you know. Because I've sat there and I watched people yeah. get like, yeah. companies get money. I'm like, that yeah. is yeah. not going to produce Remember, this any is a kind of profit. And they're like, but no, some of it works in the Ponzi scheme. Some of the Ponzi schemes don't work. This is the beauty and also the the you know the, the ugliness of right. fictitious capital. Fictitious right. capital can make people this extremely is, rich, like a Jeff Bezos like or a Bill Vegas, Gates right. or whatever. Yeah. And you know you have price earnings ratios. I mean, there are companies out there that have that just have one drug, but because of early clinical trials, phase one clinical trials are valued astronomically. You know. There are people that you know specialize in this. Just do this is their research only in this this area, um, you know, etc. And exactly. think about the doctors. We talk about inside information. That's the doctors right. are getting all kinds of inside information because people are bringing them stuff, free. Try this. We experiment with this. So you know the hedge fund people. They hire people to go around to talk to so so Park Avenue doctor. You know, is this for real? Is this not for real? They start interviewing these people. So they're doing, quote, anthropologic, actually finance capital, field work. Right. Right? Yeah, just like the analysts going to visit companies. You know, they go to visit. They talk to management. It's they talk to workers. Phase testing. What's called phase four testing for yeah. a drug is when it's on the market. Yes. That's the fourth. Yeah. Actually, we're yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're using. I mean, I bought for a, 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 a cousin of mine a, a small an account that you know they let me just handle. You know, I mean, I, we do pretty well. I bought something called Canatus. They have a liver experimental drug. I bought it at 420 because it had gone down from eight because of a failed clinical trial. Not failed, but suspicions around the data that came out of phase one clinic. But I bought it when it was depressed. Mm -hmm. We made 30% last week, just on this going back up, because there has to be something, you know, 
I'm speculating here, but there has to be something going on, you know, at this moment that people are starting to buy it, right? Even, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it, it, it's interesting how this works, because if you, you actually are in the moment of trying to look at it, you know, with cancer drugs, it, it used to be something called Guilford Pharmaceuticals. I knew one of the doctors, his name was Solomon Snyder. They had, they were able to target centers where depression is in the brain, supposedly, <laughs> and they had new drug delivery systems, right, et cetera. The Guilford Pharmaceuticals was a big winner for some people including him. But they never made any money, they went belly up. But for five to seven years, it made people money that you actually can put back into the sphere of circulation, into consumption, et cetera, et cetera. Here's so this is a very complicated, I mean, I want you to kind of, you know, but, we're in, yeah, but if we simplify it, she's really a bait, and she's a fancy bailout. Because if her stock starts to go down because she doesn't have any capital, we dump more capital in there, she's bailing it out, making sure it keeps no, going. No, she may want to expand, that's why she wants well, more capital. She goes she and says, have... we're doing great, Johnny. We're doing great. Well, that's different from... Great, Lord yes. Weinstein. There's <laughs> different, <laughs> money. That's different from, yeah. we haven't turned a profit yet, and we still need to keep right. pumping more right. money into right. it. Right. That's, well, that, that's what some people do. Yeah. yeah. Right. But just in terms of the yeah. way <coughs> that, that, you know, it's being represented here or not, I mean, you have Excuse the poisonous you. stuff, the false stuff, you know, like with the Theranos, you have hula, hula hoops, and then you have products that people really want or could really use. So yes. That's all... It's Yes. And yeah, I mean, it's, you, if you start thinking of this as, quote, all bad, right. right, or all good, you're missing the point. I mean, there are many levels of ambiguity in all of this. I'm not saying there's a good right. capitalism and a bad capitalism, but there are companies that are delivering, you know, Procter & Gamble, you know, it's all over the Colgate Palmolive, you know, the Kraft company, junk food, mac and cheese, and other products, but still, these are companies that have stood this test of time, that have increased the shareholder value, uh, uh, you know, over the, this period, and they're considered what they call the blue chip, right? This is the thing, you know, uh, and this was part of the index that I did last time when we went over the Dow index, was always considered the, the blue chip index. What reflects best American capitalism, right, in terms of its best corporations? And these usually with the highest capitalized stocks. So this is why this index is always reported on WW, whether it's a Win News and all the WINS, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and sometimes they preface it by singing "Stormy Weather" or "Let the Sunshine In," or you know, the music's there if the market's up or down. You know, I mean, this this call. I mean, I'm telling you, totally perverse, and at the same time, you know, it, it works. I mean, <laughs> from most uh, you know people's minds, you know, in a strange way, you know, in a very strange way. So yeah, I mean, th yeah, th they're they're you know. Good and bad. I mean, Amazon, I'm sure, is being studied actively at Wharton, at Stanford, at Stern, at the business school, as a case study of you don't really have to make money because of these movements between bank capital and, and the exchange, right? Except, and why Amazon is capable of golding, going to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and you just don't go to one. You go to a consortium. It's like consortiums in education. Hopefully, you'll be able to take courses at other <laughs> court, universe institutions in the CUNY system and get credit. But anyway, they have consortiums between the investment bankers where there's a lead underwriter, that's what it's called, the under, not the undertaker, but the underwriter, <laughs> right, of the securities, right? And, and the, in this underwriting process, say in Rachel's case, again, going back to the five, uh, you know, the 20 million shares at $5 a share, that Goldman will do 10, Morgan Stanley will do five, and the rest five split up between eight or nine little investment banking houses who then get on the phone. It used to be this way, get on the phone, they'd say, hello Beth, I've got, you know, a really great new company here. Do you have an extra, you know, 10, 20,000? I think we can really make some money. So they start selling to their clients, or the word is passed around, this is a hot issue mm -hmm. to come, and, you know, they sell it this way. So that's part of what the quote unquote, why he calls it promoter profit. You know, why he's calling it promoter profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because they're promoting the company. They're writing out, and then it's and then it's fed to analyst Sean Romero, who is going to, you know, say, yes, this is good. I see a futures earnings potential here of a dollar a share. It's only valued at five x, which is well below Ralph Lauren, which is twenty x. 
you know, so there's an enormous room for price movement, and he writes this report that's passed around to the community, to the hedge funds, to the others, and they start reading this, yeah, okay, we, we're going to put, you know, we'll buy half a million shares, we'll buy 100,000 shares, etc., and they start bidding it up. You have to think of this like an auction market, too. If someone's raising their hand and saying, I bid 625, and the next person, I'll bid 630. And then someone goes back down, I'll sell it to you for 620. And someone, I'll buy it back at 625. So this is a back and forth, and very much like an auction. Mm -hmm. Like an auction, a very generalized, fictitious but in auction. nanoseconds. Nanoseconds, yeah, much faster than I talk, and yeah. I talk fast. <laughs> yeah. Automated. Yeah, automated too. Yeah, I'm not automated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway. It's hard to think about. Yes, it is. No, you're right. When we think about the, what what kind of mathematics, really the quants, does. and the people that have come out of the schools, as I mentioned, I think earlier uh, in this uh, Sunday series, that you know, 50% of the Princeton graduates want to go into investment banking. Yeah, yeah. They want to go. Show me the money. Yeah. Show me the money. Right. Right. Pay me or trade me used to be the thing in sports, 70s and 80s. Right? Now it's show me the money. Mm -hmm. That came out of the sports agents. Mm -hmm. Pay me or trade me came out of the actual players. Right? It's interesting. You know, when you begin to look at the function of cliché, too, mm -hmm. in all of this, how the cliché works and the language that's used. I think this is very, very uh, significant as, uh, you know, as we look at this. But you kind of understand the process. I mean, you have an idea, right? You have a connection, right? You have a product. You know, what's that stupid movie Lawrence played in, Jennifer Lawrence with De Niro as her father, about the I woman in the special vacuum cleaner or whatever it was? It. Yeah. That was about a startup. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was like a single mother. And yeah. She, yeah, yeah. Was he like the husband wasn't working? I think. <laughs> yeah, she was a single mother. No <laughs> yeah, and De Niro was her father, who was connected to this Italian uh, Bellinese. Right. Is it worth seeing? Yeah, yeah it's worth seeing. I mean, it's it kind of interesting. Right? It's interesting in terms of how she got her company started and what she did. Yes. Yeah. 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 What it was about. I forgot. I didn't know the company. She went to shopping TV. Shopping TV channel. Yeah. Shopping channel. Yeah. The guy liked her, shopping around. but it couldn't. It yeah. didn't work. Right. right, and then she ended up finding right. a loophole in the contract and going to the people that screwed her over yeah. and threatened them with a huge lawsuit. And out of that, she got an IPO and you know yeah. the working capital to go on and become a major success. Oh my God. So this is so your capital Horatio Alger yeah, right. transferred to the attractive sim single mom, right? Jennifer Lawrence, the single mom, right? Anyway, yeah. You know, hooray for all they want, as yeah, yeah. to say. Yeah, hooray for all they yeah. yeah. So, um, anyway, so, again, remember, this is, again, I mean, I, I want to repeat, it's all based on expectation. It's a, it's a temporal anticipation and expectation of future earnings. The potentiality is actually much higher than the actuality. Hence, while you have a multiple, of what the actual price is to what the company actually makes, which is called, is a very basic term in stock market parlance, called the price earnings ratio. So if a company makes, Rachel's company, let's say, makes the first year with her um, 5 million shares, they make uh, $10 million, they're making $2 a share, which means that at five, they only have a 2.5 price earnings multiple. Which, and Ralph Lauren has a 20 price earnings multiple. So to come up to that expectation, which is happening at, a, at another level, Rachel's stock could go from $5, you know, because of those earnings, all the way up to $50 to catch up with Ralph Lauren's, you know, valuation and price on the stock exchange. You understand? I mean, you know, this yeah. is, so it's, it's, it's kind of like the, this is what's, you know, going on. So the future earnings. So everything becomes short-termism, to use a phrase that was used before Stiegler, but I like the way he uses it. Everything is quarter to quarter in Wall Street. How much money is an anticipated earnings to be? So that you get mean estimates that Rachel's company will earn 40 cents for the quarter. Some people think 30 cents. Sean O'Mara says 45, that's the high end versus 30 on the low end. If it comes in at 45, usually the stock will go way up, right? 
after that happens, but it's quarter to quarter. And then if it's a disappointment, right, it's going to go down. You're going to have the disappointing quarter. So nothing is really thought long term by a lot of the programs because they're programmed to think in three month cycles. But isn't yeah, that please. somewhat yeah. different from the? It seems like that's fundamentally different from my father's way of investing, okay. um, or his generation that yeah, you listen. bought stocks, you bought blue stock, blue chip stocks, and you held them. Yes. But now you hold them for a nanosecond, and then you turn them over. Well, not you individually, yeah. but I mean the investment, the investment right. firm. Not, not all, but yes, that but happens a lot. it seems like they, they are purchased and, and sold when they're in, in huge blocks, when right. they're incremental movements of the yeah. price for massive profits because it's huge blocks, but yeah. they're not held. In the language all. of Wall Street, your father was an investor. He was considered a long-term investor. He believed in the United States. You know, he, I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> he, he believed in, you know, the future of capitalism, so he bought shares of IBM or, you know, Procter & Gamble or the blue chip staples, right? In a way. He put them away. He got dividends over the years, et cetera. They became increased in value over long periods of time, and that's the way he thought. A lot of this changed because you had a distinction between the investor and the trader. The trader, all the trader cares about, the trader only cares about making a profit as soon as possible. You have short-term traders, you have long-term traders. And by the way, Kenneth Burke, an exceptional poet, the father of Eleanor Leacock, who I have to mention, wrote the, a great introduction to the origin of the family private property yeah. in the state. Yeah, that's the daughter of Kenneth Burke, okay. the poet and, and, and literary critic. In his book, uh, The Philosophy of Literary Form, he does speak about short-term and long-term traders, you know, in terms of nothing. So short-term, you're, you're talking about nanosecond traders, where people sit there like friends in 3.21, 3.222, 3.3, they're looking at charts, sell, 3.24, buy back, 3.19. Sell again, 3.25, you know, etc. All day long, and the machine is kind of programmed to do this, and you're starting to build, you know, mathematical models that play this out. That's a part of the market. It's an, it's a yeah, very big aspect. part of the market. Yeah. One aspect, this nanosecond trade. But still, the big firms, right, will take long-term positions. So Einhorn, you know, will take long-term positions. His big position right now is General Motors. Yeah. And he's got a big long-term position of about uh, 10 million shares. He's got a half a billion dollars invested in his hedge fund in, in General Motors, or close to that, right? He believes that it's going to be the real player in China going forward. You're also getting a very good dividend. He's analyzing this. He's a value, what's called a value investor, right? He's, been, he's investing in quote unquote. Hey, Phil. Hey. Uh, I mean, he did food left for you. He came in time just, before just it got completely cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We were going to mark you absent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So, th there are many things the short term trader, the long term trader, the swing trader. A swing trader will buy for 60 days, 90 days, try to take advantage of swings, looking at patterns on charts where stock was at a certain point, is it building a new base, will it go further? So there are all kinds of these techniques that are going on. And I don't want us to lose in this, even though we're dealing with the fundamental critique of it, on the one hand, I don't want us to lose a lot of the inter- <laughs> gray areas that are happening in terms of the language they use. I was just thinking about yeah. something. When you're talking about the spec, uh, making a guess it quarter to quarter on the price of the share, like going up by 0.45, that seems to be a scheme that a lot of people have been using to cook their books to make it seem like their capitalization, I mean, their, their, their value had gone up by 0.45. And I fear, is it to gain access to capital against that market? Well, market yeah, if they, if they blow up the books, I mean, or inflate the books, they're trying to go to the investment banking houses and show yeah. that we've got more availability, you know, we have greater anticipation of future earnings. To get right? access and to capital. And we want to get access yeah. to more bank capital. Right, right. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we've seen it's stories like of that. It's like refinancing the mortgage, yeah. too. I mean, it's akin in some ways to saying, yeah, yeah, you know, I see that the mortgages and rates are down now. Right. I'm paying 6% on my mortgage. I want to pay now 3%. So I go in and refinance. You get the bank 
fee, you know, the promoter's profit on being able to write you. You know, when you go in the bank to make a loan, to get a loan, you're actually creating money for the bank. The bank doesn't have that money available. You're creating the money. That's You have to realize that when you sit down with the banker. Who yeah. might, you know, I've said this to a bank bankers before, you know, they'd say, you think I'm stupid? I said, that's a prerequisite for the job. Yeah. <laughs> I got in trouble. <laughs> yeah. 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 But anyway. Did he say it didn't feel like a safe space? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 They didn't, they didn't say, say thank you, sir. Have <laughs> you ever seen the movie The Gambler? It's a great film. There's a great scene in the bank because James Conn is a uh, gambling addicted. It's James Toback, by the way. It was the script, and it's the story of him and his gambling addiction. Yeah. And it was made by Carol Weeks, but he wrote the script. And James Conn is a puny English professor who has a gambling problem. And he's in debt to the mob. But he comes from a very wealthy family. And his mother is, a, is a, a doctor in a Harlem um, heroin clinic. And he has to go get her to get some money out because they're going to you know, basically kill him if he doesn't pay the money. So they go to the bank, and the banker is on the phone with his girlfriend. And finally, James Conn takes the phone, takes the cord, the old cord phones, and wraps it around his neck. This is my mother. She's here to get some money, and we demand service. So anyway, the first thing for me telling her was a prerequisite for a job. It's a great sequence. Jackie Brooks was the actress, and James Conn was the uh, actor. I don't know. And the guy was perfectly cast as the banker in the shark skin suit and uh, sitting there with his feet on he the desk. Good, How yeah. you doing, baby? You know, on the other line. What? What's that? He would have been good in that role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, true. So um, anyway, um, yeah, so I mean, again, I, I want us to be aware of these kind of, you know, there's a difference between Beth's father, the investor, my father, stocks will always go up, Michael. I mean, it was a stupid comment, but anyway. They'll come back. They'll come back, right? Wall this Street was, Week was mm -hmm. like the protected hour. Lewis, every Lewis week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't yeah. bother yeah. Dad when he's watching. Yeah. With that gray hair, the George Washington one. Yeah. Did you notice that? He looked like they, they tried to make him look like George Washington. <laughs> this was before their time. But the, the image is interesting. Have they no Lewis. decency? What's that? Have they no decency? No decency at all. No, 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 no. No shame. <laughs> no shame. Louis Rockheiser. <laughs> well, George Washington was real estate speculator. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Fort Greene. Yeah. 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 Washington Park. Yeah. Fought there. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, anyway. Um, Going back to this again, I want, I want it to retain, I keep repeating this, but it's all based on future expectations, future expectations. Yeah. And, and, and someone like a Buffett, the difference between Buffett and say, um, um, and uh, Einhorn, they're both value investors versus that, uh, what's the guy's name that was in uh, the, uh, the health food thing? Uh, Ackman. Ackman, Bill Ackman. Ackman. These kind of people who try to be shareholder activists and take over corporations and be telling them. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a firm down. Yeah, Loeb is another one. These are the people that are doing very different kind of approaches. And then Diallo, Bridgewater Associates, and Mercer are in a different league, a different plane. They're more what you're talking about in terms of using the quants to the phone. Diallo's and got then, like a cold going. He's got a cold. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's Mercer that's too. Weird Mercer too. <laughs> Mercer's got a call to the White House. Yeah. yeah. So this is, you know, again, Greenwich, Connecticut, and company. And most of you remember long-term capital was one of the hedge funds that started to do this experimentation with quants and this, this Another great book, When Genius <laughs> Failed, about yes, right. MCTM. Right, right, right. I love these books. Yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that. I see that. That's yeah. like beach reading. For yeah, yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So anyway, okay, so I mean, we kind of, I guess, you know, kind of covered this, this diagram Very and its implications yeah. and all of that. So that's how the joint stock company is formed. And of course, the analysis of the giant joint stock company is before that, you know, but it's in the book by Sweezy and Baron, Monopoly Capital. How does this work? And, you know, et cetera. How does the joint stock company become part of monopoly capital? And most of you know from American history courses, I hope, about vertical and horizontal trusts of the 20s 
that you have this moment in speculative capital where you can create, where you have a banker and the Gulf Oil Company together, the Mellon, the Mellon family. They're going to be out there for a while, Mr. Hood. We could terrorize that guy in Connecticut. Yeah. He never came down the street again after this. Is this some kind of mind control? <laughs> yes, it is okay. mind control. The good humor man, we used to call it. It's creepy. Oh, it's, it's really creepy. It's very creepy. Pop it's goes the weasel. Like, yeah. Pop goes yes. the weasel. Yes. Yeah, Pop, Pop goes the weasel. weasel. Yeah. I don't want anything weasel. from those vans. Don't think about the words. Another, another <laughs> Allen ball. It's good. It makes you know. It's still so refreshing. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, okay, so to, to move on, I wanted to... Um, uh, also, um, um, talk about page 118, just a couple of sentences. I'll try to go through this in terms of some of the propositions. What, that 118? It, uh, 118, that's the, uh, the, uh, section 2, the financing of corporations. Um, um, you see section 2 of this chapter 7, the financing of corporations, corporations and banks. Yeah. Okay, the third paragraph, time. Share prices will fluctuate not only as a result of the changes in the yield or of increases and decreases of the capital and active use, but also because of changes in the general rate of interest. Okay? So this whole thing of the Fed policy, yeah, it's a bad. Yeah, I'll wait. The Fed rate person. Yes, yeah. This is why the Fed is so actively read today. Remember, again, he's writing this 1910 before the Fed or the central bank is really established to the degree it is today. Yeah. That's really amazing. It's incredibly impressive. Yes. Everybody watches the Fed. You know, last week's market decline was based on the Fed. Well, you know, every time the the Fed comes out with a rot with a raise in the rates the the major economists of the major financial institutions get together and issue statements saying, Ooh, we're getting close to another crash. Right. It's like um, it's it's blackmail. Yes. <laughs> it really is. No, they are they are about that blackmail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No so question about it. They don't want the radar. No. Exactly. So, but this this shows you right here. This paragraph anticipates what Friedman and company in, in at the Chicago School right of economics basically did advance monetary capital because a low interest rate over a long period of time will make it possible, ceteris paribus, for share prices to rise, while a high rate of interest will have the hot I mean, all effect. things being equal? Yes. 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 Partially, partially certain. Yeah. Yeah. Shares being certain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for the nat- natural... That single paragraph. <laughs> yeah. Pretty amazing, like, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's all there. That's almost all you need to know That's about right. the interaction the between, between the Fed and the market. And the exchanges, yes, yeah, Dean, exactly. Dean Baker had an interesting piece, you know, basically. You like liberal economists. <laughs> 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 so He's smart. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, he was just saying that he was slamming the New York Times because the New York Times was saying uh, something about how, you know, raising the interest rates was to maintain confidence, you know. Uh-huh. And he was like, no, it's not. <laughs> right. It's to slow down the economy. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. So anyway, let's look at uh, uh, two, three paragraphs going. The issue of shares in such a quantity, I mean, this was something we were talking about, as to depress the price below the nominal value, below par, is referred, referred to as stock watering. It is clear that this is purely just a matter of accounting, which you were talking about cooking the books earlier. Mm-hmm. The yield is given and this determines the price of the share as a whole. Naturally, the larger the number of shares, the lower the price of each individual share. The practice of watering stock has nothing to do with the promoter's profit, which arises whenever a corporation is formed. You know, this guy's going to get his due. He's going to extract his pound of flesh. The Shylocks are always the promoters, right? They're going to get it whether you make money or not, yeah, whether you're successful or not. Through the transformation of productive, profit-yielding capital into fictitious, interest-yielding capital. In fact, the watering of stock is not at all essential in an unlike promoter's profit. It can be, as a rule, as a rule, be prevented by law. The pr- provision in the German law relating to shares, which requires that any premium on shares must be credited to the reverse, reserves, has simply the effect 
had the effect that the shares are turned over at par or at a small premium to a bank consortium which sells them to the public at a profit. That's the promoter's profit. Again, then they go the types of shares invested in the United States. Now remember, Germany is caught up with the United States, right? There's a difference in capital, you know, formation in the early U.S. stock exchanges in the 20th century and the Germans. The Germans were more regulated, too. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. comes up with two dominant or distinct types of shares when large corporations are formed. The preferred and the ordinary. The preferred are where you get the yield. You buy a preferred stock, it's preferred. The reason that's being used is that you were taken care of in the event of a default, right? That's first and foremost. Then the ordinary shares, right? Only after the claims of the preferred shares have been met can dividends be paid on the ordinary shares. So you used to have PFD. I'm sorry? Weren't you asking about that? Oh, I thought you were asking about preferred versus ordinary. Oh, no, it was, it was Chris and I, she was asking. Okay. Um, so it's just a preferred where you get automatic dividend payouts. Automatic. International paper, 7% preferred stock at $25 a share. If, if you buy, say the $25 goes down to 20, you're losing, you know, I mean, you can buy it at 20 and you're going to get a greater yield because it's priced at 25 to yield 7%. So at 20, you're still getting your dollar 75 per share. So at 20, the yield goes up to over eight, you know, and a half percent. You understand this? So, so the share price is the fluctuation. If the price becomes depressed or goes down, the, the amount of the yield is greater, right? The same thing with bonds. If the bond goes from a $1,000 face value down to 950, that 5% decline in the bond will reflect itself if you buy at 950 in terms of the interest you get back. You're going to get a higher yield than, let's say, it's the it's supposed to yield at 5.5%. Price down, yield increase. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, so preferred acts a lot like a bond. Okay. Yeah, preferred stock does act, you're right, you're actually, uh, um, you know, uh, creating debt through another market capitalization. Right. Instead of issuing a bond, right, that can be rated, you're offering a preferred stock to the general investor, right, in a, in a way, which yeah. a bond has to be rated by law today, you know, in a, in a sense, right, yeah, to the preferred stock. But this was a phenomenon early in U.S., you know, exchanges. Right. So this is 1910 he's talking about. This was prominent up until about the 60s and 70s, whereas corporations began to recognize, you know, with the derivatives market and all this, and by floating different kinds of bond issues and retiring debt, you know, the general the accounting principles changed in such a way that didn't make it, you know, so necessary to have preferred uh, shares. So you have to remember, this is like products of paper. You know, fictitious capital that is creating kind of products on paper. So you're saying back. Yeah. The preferred shares the aren't future. really offered anymore. Not as much. Okay. No, very, very little compared to back in this basic sense between the ordinary shares and the preferred. Would you get a preferred uh, share if your company wasn't yet uh, publicly traded but had stocks internally? No, you have to be publicly you traded to, to issue okay. preferred shares. Because you have to sell them to the stuff. Yes. This is this is all part of the exchange yes, language, yes, okay. the stock exchange language, okay. not whether it's preferred. That would be restricted stock. Say, Rachel okay. says, I want to just keep part of this company to myself yeah. and part of it private. So she issues to herself a million shares of restricted stock that cannot be uh, sold into a certain day or not subject to market conditions. Gotcha. You know, there will be a value in the future. Okay. Yeah. Preferreds are sellable? Yes, they're tradable. Tradable, tradable yes. yes. Yeah, tradable. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Buy and sell them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not only saleable. Mm -hmm. They're both, you can buy and sell them actively on the markets. Let me see if there's one in the table. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I haven't read the, the whole the stock tables in a long time. Um, no, it's just the corporations. I mean, this is corporate capitalism and it's worse. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying something. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't see um, I don't see uh, the preferred uh, stocks, but I'll, I'll look carefully, and next time, definitely. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, again, um, yeah, I mean, again, this is the consumer rates and rate returns to investor. You know, the U.S. consumer rates that you pay on your, you know, basically on your, um, uh, the benchmark where the, bail, where the target rate is and what the money market is doing related to the federal funds. So they're reading this as figures. You know, M1 is money in circulation and demand deposits. M2 is money in circulation, but not part of demand, but longer term savings accounts. So they have all these categories of types of money that the Fed is looking at. And again, the best publication, at least to my knowledge, I don't know if this has changed, but five years ago it was always the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis that put out the best reports. They're the ones that do the best uh, reports. And the best thing to read on this is it's, a, it's high, very expensive, but you can get, you can go to their website, it's the Bank Credit Analyst out of Montreal. This was created in post-World War II, 1948, and it's uh, right across the street from McGill University uh, is where their headquarters are. They do very good research into these kind of things between currencies, you know, bond rates, um, and uh, of course, um, um, you know, uh, these um, uh, consumer rates and Fed rates. So they're very interesting. So anyway, you get the idea of what the averages are. So you a five-year CD, and this is why the markets are going to. Another reason, a five-year CD is only paying you, on average, 1.73. You're getting back your about 11% compounded if you put your money into safe, the so-called so -called safe haven, right? Whereas if you're in money market, you're only getting a half of 1% a year. So the CD is 1.2% better, okay? Then you see the prime rate is now 5%. This is prime lending rate is 5%. You know, during, after 2007, 8, um, I think it went as low as one and a half, two percent 2%. So it's back up to 5 right now in the money lending. And, um, and then they have the mortgage rates and the new car loans, and you can see we're still somewhat dominated by uh, Fordism, you know, um, 4.23 to buy an a automobile, right? So um, mortgages 4.52 on a five-year, and a 30-year is 4.39. So they give you these statistics, right? These are the consumer rates every week. Then they give you the Treasury yield curve. This is what the U.S. borrows, right? The treasuries, they have to pay 3% right now. To me, I have a thesis that part of the reason there's so many kids in school and why they have this kind of almost open admissions policy to so many schools, and right, is because they know what this would do to the unemployment statistics. And this rate that they pay would go up, uh, you know, billions of dollars on the debt in the U.S. So they can provide statistics that we have 14 to 15 million people in higher education and, uh, you know, they're not unemployed. But if you really tightened up, tightened the screws a little bit, uh, who gets in and who doesn't or whatever, you may have half that number. You know, I mean, literally people graduating from college that can't read or write. Yeah. But here in jail, you're not employed either. That's right. That's another thing in jail. You know, and short term, you know, temporary part time employment is not in that statistic either. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, this is a way of keeping the U.S. as Looking being able, not only the military dictatorship of the world, but also, in a way, you know, the cheapest borrower in the world, right? Pay the less on the, on the debt. So they can sell to the Saudis, you know. I mean, if you remember Desert Storm, the the, the first uh, Iraq War, right in, in the 90s, that was because you know Saddam Hussein wanted to go in and reclaim property in in, in Kuwait, and you know what the U.S. had to do, and the Bush family and the Carlyle Group, their their group of investors, was very integral to this. They had to go to war because Kuwait held 50 billion dollars worth of treasuries. And they were threatening to dump it unless the U.S. Yeah. military didn't do yeah. something. That's one yeah. of the reasons, among others. But it's certainly one prime reason of why we went to war during that time. Fifty billion. Fifty billion at that time. Yeah, mm. yeah, huge savings and loans debacle. You know, remember the yeah. Neil yeah. Bush? We never see yeah. him. Yeah. yeah, he went to Tulane. <laughs> <laughs> the C student. 
Yeah. Do you know why they told uh, Hussein that? Because uh, he kind of checked in with the Bushes and said, you know, so um, what if I were to uh, take over Kuwait? And they were like, eh, you know, no biggie. Well, yeah. I think the Kuwaiti princess had to. Well, I, I stayed in a hotel in Montreal for a couple of days at the downtown Centreville, and they had this World Economic Forum, and one of the sponsors and one of the sheiks from the Kuwait Petroleum Company was there. You can imagine my slurs as I'm walking by <laughs> these entourages. I asked yeah. one of the guys, is the harem here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, so, anyway, yeah. It's strange, yeah. So anyway, yeah, I mean, again, this debt of the United States, again, these levels of debt, the treasuries, the sovereign wealth funds, the, all of these things are part of the debtor, you know, uh, economy in, in a way, right? The bonds, right? Then you go through grades of bonds, you have municipal bonds, corporate bonds, et cetera. And we're going to do the biddings of our creditors. Yes, of course. Yes. How much do the Saudis hold? They hold a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's the axis. Yeah. I mean, that's what Gaza is really about. That's why nobody opens their mouth. That's what, what is it? Gaza, you know, Ga the, whole, the Palestinian right. question yeah, is yes. really about the Saudis, Israeli. You know, it's a mix yeah. of the most oppressive uh, 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 government in the world, the Saudis. I mean, it's the most backward, you know, uh, kind of culture that you can think of, you know. I mean, it's still worse than feudal society. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, the Israelis and the U.S., that's the axis in the Middle East, yeah, yeah, in many ways, and yeah. And of course, I mean, they, they fund ISIS. You know, this is yeah. so interesting. You know, it's not just that ISIS exists independent. It's an asset. It's an asset at certain times. You know, it becomes an, a, an asset, at least in, you know, the way I read it. You, know. you mean like a front line? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a front line. It's also protection, you know, in, in a way. To, yeah, yeah. And the Saudis are funding this stuff all the time. You have to think of this in terms of where where is the capital coming from? Is it only kidnapping, you know, prostitution, theft, and all these kind of things? There's much more involved here than just what you know you read, <laughs> you know, in a sense. What, what what role does the you know the, these governments in the Middle East play in this? And, and uh, yeah, and especially Saudi Arabia, yeah, especially. Yeah. Well, the Emirates too. Yeah, yeah. But Saudi Arabia has got real, Qatar. real, yeah, they got real capital, yeah. Yeah. So and even Turkey, they don't have real capital. No, but they they direct it. <laughs> yes, they help direct it. That's true. Well, I mean the Greeks. I mean you know to their credit, they were the only ones that let the Palestinian uh, banks operate, right? And they, they they welcomed the capital and they did pretty well with it from the 70s on. The PLO had accounts in Athens huh. in the Athenian bank. So there was an opening to this during the Papandreou, you know, socialist government. So it's interesting. Anyway, uh, to go back to this, um, um, you know, the preferred ordinary distinction. And then on um, the next page, uh, 118 in the book, and uh, uh, the ne next uh, paragraph, two paragraphs down, uh, the corporation is an association of capitalists, right? It is formed by each capitalist contributing his share of capital and the extent of his particular uh, participation has voting rights and the degrees of his influence are determined by the amount of capital he contributes. This is our biggest shareholder at the table. He has the biggest voice. The capitalist, the capitalist only in so far as he owns capital and he's differentiated from other capitalists only in a quantitative way. And I think this begins to explain, you know, Poulantzas, if you ever read Poulantzas' uh, class fractions in, in Poulantzas' uh, later works, um, and uh, um, uh, classes in contemporary capitalism. So hence the control of the enterprise as a whole is in the hands of those who own the majority of the shares. So you're not really a stakeholder or a shareholder. You know, you're just, you know, at the casino watching and hopefully the roulette wheel mm -hmm. kind of spins your way <laughs> on a given market day, right? This also means that a corporation can control the, the, those who own half the capital, right? And whereas it is individually owned enterprise, it is necessary to own the whole capital. So Rachel Scott no longer owns the 
whole capital when her IPO goes through. She is, but she may own 50% with her board of it and still controls it that way, right? Right? But does not really own the corporation. Disregarding here the role of, pre excuse me, um, this means that a corporate can be controlled everywhere. Um, okay. This doubles the power of the large capitalists. Disregarding here the role of credit, a capitalist who decides to turn his enterprise into a joint stock company. So this is from startup entrepreneurial capital into a joint stock company. Needs only half his capital in order to retain complete control. So I'm like the small businessman who wants to be 100% in the dry cleaning business, or in the bodega at the corner, you know, or in the you know coffee uh, you know uh, place on uh, you know, World uh, you know Freedom Tower, or whatever they call that place these days, uh, you know um, um, downtown. Um, you know, if you go public, right, you still can control it if you own half. So in a lot of ways, from going private to public. <laughs> is a very beneficial thing if you want to retain control, but only, you know, <laughs> have half responsibility or half of the shares. It's, inter it's a very interesting thing that they did in that respect. Yeah. yeah. Voting rights, you vote by shares. You vote by shares. Now this is very much on the Greek system of allotments in democracy. You voted by yeah. allotments, it's true. <laughs> yes. Some the demos, the deems are, you know, yeah, how much property you have. It might not be, um, time, the yeah. timing might yeah. be wrong, but yeah, yeah, at some sure. point, could you talk about the logic of the merger acquisition mania of the 80s and the hostile takeover? Yeah, I'll do that later. But it doesn't yeah. have to yeah, be Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. I got it. Let me write that down, though. No. Phil, let me just get under your plate mm -hmm. for a second. When you say later, do you mean September? Yeah, September, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a kind of long story. Yeah, you know, we're not meeting again. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think so. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not going to be uh, in Canada. Yeah, you can come up there and we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have room. <laughs> Some people in this room have been there. But can you make fun? <laughs> yeah. Maybe not as good as Rachel, but maybe if Rachel came, she can certainly can help. It's a high bar. Yes, Rachel has contributed to food at that place before. Yes. That's good. Well, yes. did you see they, um, the Times had a nice picture of the Jean Talon market? Yes, I did see that. I spent some nice time there on the week uh, last uh, last uh, Thursday. I was there almost all day. It was very nice. Yeah, merger action wishes mania. Yeah, I, you know what I would trace that back to, Beth, is um, MAC, the Municipal Assistance Corporation, mm -hmm. and Rohatun's involvement, 76, 77, and Rohatun's involvement as a merger acquisition uh, specialist. Pre or post fiscal crisis of New York? He was pre in terms of the mergers and acquisitions, right? The term that was used is how do you conglomerate? So you had conglomerates of which the Amazon of that period of the conglomerate were two, two LTV, Link Kempto Vought, out of Dallas, Texas, and then Gulf and Western company Charles Bluthorn, which used to be the building at, uh, at um, uh, 59th Street, Columbus Circle, the Gulf and Western building, which bought out Paramount Pictures, you know, which helped finance a little bit of Harvey Weinstein's, you know, so. Exploits. Exploits, yeah, yeah. Yeah, into into filmmaking. The other the other exploits were after he was in the film, the film that him, so to speak. Okay, so um, yeah, let's go on so a few more, and then I guess we'll we'll, we'll finish by uh, you know three uh, three thirty since people have to go. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean the joint stock company. Let's let's go on to the stock exchange, which is chapter eight. And, uh, you know, we'll go back and forth, too, as we go on. Um, he, he's very careful in definition, and this is page 130, chapter 8 of part 2, Securities and Speculation. The stock exchange is the market for securities. By securities, I mean here every kind of strip which represents forms or sums of money. They fall into two main groups, groups and here we go. Certificates of indebtedness or credit certificates which bear a, semblant, a statement excuse me, of the amount of money for which they are issued, the principal example being the bill of exchange. Two, certificates which do not represent 
a sum of money, but as its yield. The latter may be further divided into two groups, fixed interest paper, such as debentures and government bonds, and B, dividend certificates, that is shares. Sorry, right? how many paragraphs in after the first paragraph? Oh, it's he's just defining paragraph. the stock exchange as a market for securities, and then he's beginning to differentiate this in terms of two main groups, the certificate of indebtedness and the dividend oh, certificate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was in And bill of exchange means what? Bills of exchange are what you basically are, are paying, you know, the bank issues a certain amount of money, you pay them back a certain amount of money. This is a this is a thing that they put on their books for, you know, yeah. Uh, lending, you know, you have accounts receivable, accounts, you know, payable uh, in terms of corporate books. In the banks they keep it, you know, what what is lent out, what is on demand, what is not, etc. Right? So yeah. Anyway, money or the value of equal magnitude but actually been lent. The prime consideration, right? Um, uh, as the case of credit certificates, the amount of money they represent. So the credit certificates category one, or value of equal magnitude has actually been lent and now bears interest. So it's an actuality, the certificates of indebted indebtedness. How much do you owe as a corporation, right? Et cetera. What are you in hock for, et cetera. The certificates circulate for a specific period of time and are withdrawn when the capital is repaid. You retire the debt, right? You retire the debt. The bill has fallen due. Bills are always falling due and the bill which has been lent that flows back to the lender. The latter now has the money in his hands once more and can proceed. So he's describing obviously here the cycle of lending, right? Or the circle, yes. The cycle in which bills fall due and the capital flows back continually to its owner as a condition for the constant renewal of the process. So you pay back this one, would you like, uh, you know, you got 50 million the first time, how about 100 million this time? You're a good customer. You can have it. You're very good, <laughs> you're very good, please, please take it. I'm gonna give you a lower rate of interest even. You know, so this is gonna create, quote unquote, much more value for me because I created 100 million for you the first time and I got 5% of that back each year, right? And you paid it off in four years. So we made the bank, you know, 23 million if it compounds out. Thank you very much. We'll do this again for you, even at a lower interest rate. So the cycle starts. So this is basically the, the bank capital cycle. The situation is different with the second group of securities, since here the money is definitively surrendered. In the case of government bonds, it may have been withdrawn from productive uses for a long time and thus cease to exist. You know, you don't buy Tennessee Valley Authority bonds anymore. Right? Yeah. Oops. Um, Where's the pity? Yeah, it's just a moment. Yeah. Okay. So, um, anyway, the, the money is uh, definitively surrendered. In the case of government, if bonds have been withdrawn from their productive use for a long time and thus cease to exist or put into industrial shares. It's been used to buy constant and variable capital. And you know, if you remember from your readings in capital, this is a crucial you know, distinction made in Marx, right? We gotta take salary, right? <laughs> We've got to build plants, different types of capital. We need to expand, etc. Right? So, the money is in the hands of the sellers of this productive capital and will never return to its starting point. It follows, therefore, that shares cannot represent the money because it has passed from the seller of commodities, of the elements of productive capital, and has become their property. But neither do they in any way represent the productive capital itself. In the first place, the shareholders have no claim to that part of the productive capital, but only to its yield to the exchange, right? You don't get part of the profit, you know, say selling the widgets, selling the car, right? Only to the yield, right? And this is basic in terms of how alienating this really is, right? Because at least Mar Marx understood that the labor is alienated from, quote, the value that is being produced. Okay, so, um, 
It does not, you know, um, uh, shares unlike vouchers or bills of lading, does not represent any specific use value as it would have to if it were really a share in the capital actually used in production, but is only a claim to a certain amount of money. This money is, however, nothing more than the yield capitalized at the current rate of interest. Hence, the yield or annual income is the basis on which the certificate is valued. And only after the yield is known is the amount of money calculated. Fixed interest certificates have some resemblance to those of the first group in the sense. So he's talking about certificates of indebtedness. Bonds. Uh, yeah, bonds, right, exactly. Right? Um, and have some resemblance to those in the first group in the sense that a fixed return at a given point in time always represents a definite sum of money. Nevertheless, they fall into the second category because the money which they originally represented has been definitively given up and does not return to a starting point. The capital which they represent is fictitious and its magnitude is calculated on the basis of its yield. The difference between fixed interest certificates and other titles to income seems to be, if we disregard fortuitous influences, that the price of the former depends upon only upon the rate of interest, while the price of the latter depends, upon, depends both on the rate of interest and the current yield on capital. It's a big difference. The former group, therefore, is only such as to, subject to comparatively minor fluctuations in price and when each such fluctuations occur, they are graded and follow the more easily predictable fluctuations in the rate of interest. By contrast, the rate of return in the second group is indeterminate and subject to countless changes. Thank you so much. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Which cannot always be foreseen. Okay. And, and this produces cons considerable fluctuations in the price of these certificates. They're a favorite target of speculation. So it's not bond speculation that's really the game here. It's the other kind, the yield speculation, right? Fictitious capital. Wait, make that distinction again? Well, it's not the, it's not the indebted, certificates of indebtedness or the, bond that is the favorite target of speculation, but the other type, right? The fictitious capital that becomes the favorite target of speculation. And that is yeah, because? You have much greater potential for movements and fluctuations. Because it's based it does on not return to the starting future point. possibility. It does not come back to the starting point right. and is much more based on future expectation than actual yield. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay? So um, it follows from what has been said that the cautionary, customary, excuse me, description of the stock exchange as the capital market misses the essential nature of that institution. The certificates in the first group are certificates of indebtedness, and most of them originate in, uh, in circulation, in the transfer or commodities without the intervention of money except as a mean of final settlement. Right? Okay? You finally settled. You've paid off all the bond interest. Right? The bond matures at a certain day. There is no maturity to fictitious capital. It's eternal. Mm -hmm. Right? It's eternal. Out of time, can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? Whereas you have a fixed, determinate time where a bond will mature. Anywhere from 50 years to three years, you know, it depends on what you're looking at, you know. Usually the longer period out, the greater your rate of interest. Yeah. That's why deterministic um, Marxism doesn't work, right? Mechanical Marxism fails because the, the future is infinite in a way. Stop. Yes, in many ways. I mean, the deterministic markets, Mar Marxists are only dealing with a teleological right. model right. that you have a beginning, a middle, and an end, yeah. right, to this. Whereas, you know, when you start dealing with categories of fictitious capital, there's no, there's no end. There's no tele teleological here. It's non-teleological. And it's very much like infinite regress in phenomenology, that you can infinitely regress to the thing itself. Right. You, know, you know, when people talk about, I mean, I've, I've started to become very interested in what makes an emotion an emotion and the processes of emotion in a certain way. 
you know, you can do an infinite regress about anger or about love or whatever, you know, constantly. So the phenomenologists, in a certain way, you know, uh, anticipate that, and uh, as does uh, the deconstructionists, you know, that you have an infinite uh, language, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and the incommensurability, you know, in, in, in uh, the incommensurability thesis is, you know, the, the Gödel's theorem. You know, uh, all, all of these things are kind of playing out in, in different ways in this. You know, even though this is 1910 that he's writing this, fundamentally this is very sound to, to, to my mind. You know, yeah, yeah, to my mind. So anyway, um, um, they're a form of credit money which replaces cash, right? The certificates of indebtedness. This is the credit card, you know, anticipated in 1910. You know, just put it on a card. You know, in terms of you know the future, right? Your future indebtedness. Yeah, so they've got that down. Um, yeah, you get it every week in the mail. <laughs> yes, I get a new deal every week. Yeah, more, you know what came from so Trump lucky. today? When they are traded on this stock exchange, a great a grant of credit is simply transferred from one person to another. The certificate circulation of credit money as we have seen, requires as its premise and complement the circulation of real money. So you have, you know, quote, this distinction of real economy, money in circulation, versus that of, quote, unquote, the, the, uh, the circulation of credit money, how much credit is available. So all of a sudden, Cray, uh, uh, Sean, Phil, and Beth, and Josh all want to buy a house. That's creating more credit money versus that of the real money. You're going into the bank. I need money, you know. But the real money is not there. You're getting, you know, a non-existent becomes an existent. As it requires as, as its premise and complement the circulation of real money. Yes. But it does not mirror. No, it does the not mirror. Real no. money it requires the real. But money. it only, its like it requires the fiction of the real economy. Yes. <clears throat> Good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, well put. Yeah. Very good. And when the but there's really no there's closer relation than that. That's, 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 the, that's the closest relation you're going to get. It's sort of, sort of the, the real economy is this theoretical foundation. You know, you yes. Make this yes. It, it's the, it's it's the base for, we are for from. the foundation, and then the strata is built, but the strata is built in such a way that you're going up a mountain that is, you know. Has no base. No, no base in right. a certain way. Yeah. So you're looking, you know. Sure. Yeah. So when the when the loan stops performing, yeah, the money is gone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it's a wonderful life. Frank Capra used to say, yeah. and then Lars von Trier re rewrites it as Dog Hill. <laughs> That's a good way of looking at all this too. It's a wonderful life. With Jimmy Stewart huh. is rewritten by Front. By Front. Front, Front no, no, no. By, <laughs> by, 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 by uh, Lars von Trier. He's a Kafka okay. figure. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, as Dogville, right? Uh, okay. Old yeah. James Conn. I was afraid to ben see that Gazzara. film. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was afraid to see that film. Maybe. It's a great film. <laughs> it is. It's a great <laughs> film. Oh no, it's so it's very. It reminds me. That's Dogville. the film I was thinking oh. about when you where you brought up connections. It's the first film that. Came to mind when you were describing connections. Uh -huh. Was Dogville just the way you said? Interesting. It. You yeah. talked about the setup, right? Like you know, people just on stage, and then you have right, yeah, sort of staging. Yeah, it's it was a great film. I mean, yeah. I think it should be. I think it should be read as the antithesis of "It's a Wonderful Life." <laughs> it takes into account Capra, but it shows the you know the, the how bad finance capital is taken over and what symptoms are on. Dogville, yeah. You know, Nicole Kidman. Mm -hmm. Great scene with, you know, the limousine and James Conn at the end. Uh, when he comes to the oh, didn't see it. I, I, I just saw the staging. Dogville. 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 Lars Von Trier. Yeah. Yeah. I've just read a lot about it. Yeah. It's a great film. Mm -hmm. It's worth seeing. I want to see it now. Yeah, it's worth yeah. it. Ben Gazzara, Nicole Kidman, James Conn are the three primary actors as well as some very other good, you know, people. All right. So anyway, he's going to go into the circulation of credit money, how this works. Um, on the next, um, um, the next page, 132, the next full paragraph, um, 
the stock exchange, the sentence begins, the stock exchange constitutes the market for the traffic and money among the banks and the big capitalists. Bills usually bear the signature of one or other of the leading banks, both domestic and foreign banks or other big capitalists put their funds in these bills which bear interest and are absolutely secure. On the other side, the large credit institutions can sell such bills on the exchange to obtain whatever funds they may need to meet obligations in excess of their freely available capital, which is again part of the real economy. So you need the fictitious economy, right, in order to keep this circulation, the sphere of circulation, moving. Yeah, fictitious capital becomes a necessity at this at this point in the sphere of circulation. Yeah. Well, the whole system freezes up. Yes, yes, it, it becomes illiquid. Yeah. Right. It becomes frozen liquid. Right. Yeah. Frozen liquidity. Yeah. Exactly. Becomes ice. Yeah. 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 Yeah, not ice is, but ice. <laughs> but ice is also in the ice. Not not ice, ice, is, ice. Is, ice is part of the system. Yes, yes, I, I said that before you came so in. Is, so is ice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So is ice, of course. True. Yes. So, anyway, although the sums of money, next paragraph, available or required for stuff to vary from time to time, a certain minimum amount is always available. This is the Fed lending, opening, tightening you know, pulling back, right, which is used to purchase the bills and then returns to the starting points when they fall due. The, this continual reflux of money, interesting word, and its function as a mere intermediary in the credit processes at once distinguishes the circulation of money which belongs to the first category of stock exchange securities from the circulation of money in the second category. And going back to those second categories, the certificates of indebtedness and fictitious capital. For example, that which is invested in shares. In the latter case, the money is definitively relinquished, converted into productive capital, and enters into the hands of those who sell commodities. It does not return to the stock exchange. In place of money, there are now capitalized claims to interest. Money here is actually withdrawn from the money market. We're talking about fixed income. Yes. The stock exchange and the banks are competitors in the bill market, and the development of the latter have actually cut into the business of the stock exchange, right? But no more is this really happening. This is, again, something that Glass-Steagall took away, right? You know, the Goldman Sachs can give you Marcus loans, can become a, a creditor institution, not just an investment banking house. They can become bankers. Right? They can do entrepreneurial capital. Right? They're no longer in just investment banking house regulated by the SEC. Okay. So anyway, um, bottom of the page, one thirty-three, about two paragraphs down. The true sphere of stock exchange activity is as a market for titles to interest or fictitious capital. So this claim upon future earnings and also titles to interest as fictitious capital. Titles to interest. Hence, or here the investment of capital is money capital, which is to be converted into productive capital, takes place. The money is committed definitively in the purchase of these titles. I'm trying to, you know, in a way, look, the, uh, the philosophy is not so separate from the political economy and vice versa, yeah. and that they're working during the same time. I mean, 1910 is an interesting period because it's pre-world, first inter-imperialist war. Nothing really to get excited about, but it displaced a lot of people, and we got bunker warfare, and this was you know, a terrible event, right. but it was not, not really a yeah. war yeah. that settled anything. It was just a settlement of you know, inter-imperialist forces. You know, in capital, right? I mean, it's the first step. The first step, <laughs> right? Before the second step. Right. Same country involved too. Yeah. Both yeah. sides. Of the, yeah. But anyway, um, yeah. So this is being written then, and then if you look at things like Adorno and, and Heidegger, they're 20 years after this in terms of when they're vying for positions of power in the German university. Hmm. You know, Adorno gives a rectal address on nature, and Heidegger gives it, of course, on the university to come. Right? and the mission of the university. 
So it's, it's very interesting to me how this sort of coincides with this market speculation that is much more about, whereas Adorno is, is, is you know, negating, negating, negating. There are all these determinate negations going on, you know, in a sense. So, you know, I mean, keep in mind, I had a discussion with a friend of mine about Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley is much more Heideggerian. You know, Amazon is much more Heideggerian. It's always about the promise in the future. But it's always about the expectation, the fictitious in a certain way. And that might be much more real right now, you know, not so much in the imaginary versus the quote unquote we understand as the real or the older economy in some ways, given where we are and how the mathematics is working. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not claiming to have, uh, you know, fully understood this or, you know, I'm just getting kind of chipping away at the iceberg here to, to see, what, see what we can get. So anyway, okay, so let's, let's look at uh, this section on speculation, too. Um, the specific activity of, of, spe of stock ex uh, exchange is really speculative, like speculation. Where is That's that? in the paragraph, or so securities and activities of function of the stock exchange have distinctive features. And it's the last sentence there. This is uh, um, about um, oh, six, seven paragraphs in. That begins the question now arises. Yeah. Yeah. And the nature of eternal value. Anyway, the, the sentence of where I really want to read is three, four, four, um, four um, um, paragraphs down. Speculation, this is page 135 in the text. Speculation consists in taking advantage of price changes, though not of changes in commodity prices. So your raw material costs or your commodity prices, soybeans is not being reflected in the price of craft food product stock right away. Right? Unlike the productive capitalists, the speculator does not care whether commodity prices rise or fall. All that concerns him is the price of the titles to interest. His titles to interest. These prices depend about the amount of profit, which can rise or fall, future earnings, as I put up, right? Um, whether prices rise, fall, or remain stationary. The decisive factor affecting profit is not the absolute level of prices, but the relationship between costs and prices. But it is also unimportant to the speculator whether profits rise or fall. He is only concerned with being able to foresee these fluctuations, the mode of prediction. Right? To use a, a now operative phrase in the scholarship out there. Right? His interests, therefore, are entirely different from those of the productive capitalists. So you have a, a types here, you know, right? The speculative capitalist versus the productive capitalist. Alfred P. Sloan and Henry Ford are productive capitalists. Je Jesse Livermore to David Einhorn to Bill Ackman are basically speculative capitalists. They produce nothing. They are playing the game to for foresee fluctuations. Right? right. Yeah. So, is it? Yeah. Um, the maximum stability of profit wherever possible and increasing, constantly increasing profit. Uh, increases in commodity prices only have an influence upon speculation insofar they're an indication of the increased profit. Speculation is affected only by such changes in profits as is either bound to occur or can be expected. But the profit which an enterprise produces is distributed to the owners of productive capital or to holders of shares without regard to speculation. Right? The speculator as such does not derive his gain from the increase in profit. He, he can gain just as easily from a fall in profit. Here's your hedge fund at work right here. Shorting, yeah. Yep. In general, therefore, it is nothing in terms of a rise in profit, but in terms of changes in the price of securities induced by a rise or a fall. Right. So you're always inferring whether something is going to go up in terms of their earnings or down, right? Mm -hmm. Or whether this is going to make it. And you're betting on that fluctuation, right? Nice in that bet there, okay? So the price fluctuations, okay? So um, just to go a little bit over, um, um, on page 137, about three, Paragraphs where we were, the, five, the paragraph beginning, furthermore, changes in the rate of um, interest.
stock market speculation is like a game of chance or a wager, but for insiders, it is a certain wager. <laughs> right? So in a way, the insider rule, of which Cohen, you know, has gotten off on that that's reading about, you know, is basically operative all the time. But gee, Michael, that's illegal. I know. It's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I was astonished. I was astonished to learn that so and so had information on that drug. It's a possible yes, shock. Shock. Completely shock. <laughs> there was gambling going on in this place, right? right? So anyway, very important to remember this distinction between the ordinary and the insider. Yeah, in many ways, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, anyway, um, uh, then the function of the stock. Sorry, issue, who is? Yeah. I'm sorry. Who yeah, it's okay. That? In that sentence, who is he defining as an insider? Um, as who? Who's the insider and who's the outsider there? Well, the outsider would be the speculator that doesn't have the information at that time, whereas the insider is the speculator someone who's also in the in business and, in the connected. Business and connected. I, as yes. opposed to someone I play golf, who thinks he can make a buck. I play the stupid game of golf with so-and-so, and he tells me, you know, we're going to have a fantastic quarter. Our stock is depressed. Buy as much as you can. Yeah. And if you're smart, you go out and you say, oh, okay, I may buy options on this, and I really have leverage, and I can make triple, quadruple my money on a, you know, five, ten. You work five, hard, you'll get rich. You know, that's why I, I can't. can't see can't, business can't, without yeah. really trying. I can't, I can sold off all of the steel stock. Who did? I can't. Oh, Carl Icahn. Yeah, yeah, he's, well, he, he talked to, he talked to Trump, Trump told him we're going we're gonna to raise the, uh, you know, oh, yeah, going to raise sure. the tariffs, and so he sold off all the steel I stuff. I mean, does anybody people? just step back and say, why do these people give millions of dollars to these candidates? I mean, you know, what, yeah. what, 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 what's the point? They just want to give away money? Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're it's stupid, like my family who gave Dukakis money because he was Greek American, <laughs> first Greek American to run for president, and forgot about Willie Horton. You know? Did they get a, Did they like, get an autograph picture? Yeah, they got all him in the tank. Yeah, all that nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you want something back. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. indeed. So, anyway, the, the function of the stock exchange, um, you can see at the paragraph in section two, in the course of economic development, right, changes. Ordinarily, it provided for the circulation. This is an important paragraph because this shows you the historical moment of the stock exchange. So the paragraph that starts as in the case of all prices? No, the function of the stock exchange, section, section two. two of chapter nine. Yeah, yeah. The first chapter. paragraph. Okay. The function of the stock exchange changes in the course of economic development. Originally, it provided for the circulation of currency and bills for which purpose it was only necessary to accumulate free money capital which could be invested in such bills. Later, it became a market for fictitious capital which first emerged with the development of state credit. It became the market for state loans, but it was radically transformed when industrial capital began to assume the form of fictitious capital. Late 19th century. What happens to railroads? What happens to the oil trusts? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The Mellon family is worth studying in this. Gulf Oil Company and Mellon Bank. Right? Mm -hmm. right? And then Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon. Right? Mm -hmm. Of course, the Rockefeller. Right? So, right? But it was radically, yeah, okay. The res resources at the disposal of the stock exchange now increase rapidly and without limit. And on the other hand, the existence of the stock exchange as a market which is always available as a prerequisite for the conversion of industrial capital into fictitious capital and the reduction of dividends to interest. The de development of a market for fictitious capital makes speculation possible. In turn, speculation is necessary to keep the market open for business at all times, 24-7, and to give money capital as such the possibility of transforming itself into fictitious capital and from fictitious capital back into money capital, whatever it chooses. Hence, the relationship and the dialectical tension always operating between bank and fictitious capital, back loan, loan capital, 
bank capital, right, versus money capital. But you can't forward. turn all the fictitious capital into money capital. No, no, of course not. Or you bring the system down. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Only in this way is the investment of capital is money capital made possible on a large scale. So he's giving you the premises, you know, the predicates of how this is operating in terms of the of the, uh, the fictitious capital. For capital is to function as money capital, it must in the first place yield a study income interest, steady income interest, and second, the principal itself must flow back, or if it does not actually flow back, it must always be recoverable through the sale of titles to interest. The stock exchange first made possible the mobilization of capital. Very important phrase is this whole section, part two of this book, is really chapters 7 through 10 is about the mobilization of capital and what role fictitious capital plays in it. How is capital mobilized? How does it keep moving? Which is fascinating. I mean, when you really think about this, how does this movement continue more and more? And how do they come up? This, this paragraph itself gives you an idea of why new historical constructs such as credit default stops, options exchanges, new forms of leverage, etc. All are working. It's a way to keep itself. it all moving. Yes, indeed. Yes, to yeah. mobilize capital. Yeah. Right? Even if it doesn't exist as such in the real economy or as bank capital. It's very interesting. Yeah. So you're really bringing it with an invention here. Think about it that way. It's an invention. You know, that's, that's it's, constantly. It's, a, it's an invention that literally creates money. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. With the help of the Fed. Yes. So it really is a big pyramid scheme. It is a big pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> look at the top, look at his book in the paperback. <laughs> is that why there's a pyramid on the dollar bill with a big eye on it? No, oh, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> what did it call the Illuminati? I thought it was yeah. Jay, 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 Jay Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the Illuminati. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, this is a very, very important uh, uh, section on okay. how the stock exchange functions. What is its role in the mobilization of capital, and why it's necessary? You know, for that mobilization. How do we get here? We want to talk about an idea of progress. This is progress. Invention of money in a different way. I'm just saying I'm being very facetious here, but you know, it doesn't have anything to do with social <laughs> social <laughs> project, right? right? Right. Yeah. So um, anyway. So it's a very, 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 very important uh, section, the function of the exchanges. Um, um, anyway, um, on page one forty one, uh, one full paragraph well, two full paragraphs, the third paragraph which uh, begins with the equality of all capital is thus realized. The last sentence there, um, uh, well, it's a very long sentence anyway. It is the function of the stock exchange to facilitate this mobilization by providing the machinery for the transfer of capital. The mobilization of capital transforms an increasing proportion of capitalist property into titles to interest, and in so doing it makes capitalist production increasingly independent of the movements of capital production. How this beginning, major separation is taking place between industrial and finance capital, between productive capital and fictitious capital, between real and irreal, if you want to use that kind of language even though the irreality is existent. Yeah. It's not that fiction necessarily means it doesn't exist. It's fictitious in relation to real, right, in this model. Okay. Yeah. And Bentham understood this very well. The theory of fictions, by the way, it's in the Verso um, edition. You have both the theory of fictions and uh, the panopticon. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I'll bring it next time, next time, right? Okay, so then he goes on um, the movement of property, you know, down in, uh, has acquired independence and is no longer determined by the process of production. For the past, the transfer of property also involved the transport of the capitalist entrepreneurial function and vice versa, but it's no longer the case, right? Whereas in earlier times, uh, the principal 
cause of changes in the distribution of property was the variability of achievements in production, and the industrial competition was thus a crucial determinant of the distribution of, of, of a property. This cause, still operative today, is now supplemented by others which stem from the circulation of income titles and may produce movements of property which neither originate in any change in productive relations nor exert any influence on production. Again, necessary condition of the system of the mobilization of capital. Right? Okay. Um, he goes on more about the concentration of capital, and uh, maybe, I mean, maybe, I know, it's, it's four o'clock, and uh, yeah. Um, the function here, uh, stock market operations, how does, how does the market uh, operate, is in section three. And then he goes on to the commodity uh, exchange, which is different in the sense that you're actually dealing with the sphere of, you know, production there. You know, but at the same time, they're also protecting, this becomes more of a hedging device, the beginning of the commodity exchange. Right? Thank you. Okay, okay well, I'll be, I'll be in touch. Yeah, and, uh, yes, yeah if we do one more, well. I'll be in touch. If not, we'll see you uh, September. Or, you know, if you're in Montreal, we, we can do it up there. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, so um, anyway, um, yeah, that, that's another uh, very, very important part. I just wanted to say, um, um, yeah, this section on the commodity uh, capital, I think it's, it's easier to read in a sense because it's more about, um, um, you know, how syndicates are formed, et cetera. You know, Paul Tudor Jones, another hedge fund, he's the nephew of D William Donovan from Memphis, who was a great stock, cotton speculator, I have to use the word great tongue-in-cheek, but anyway, uh, you know, they had all kinds of inside games going uh, over the years. And um, anyway, um, um, you begin to see how the syndicates and trusts work, you know, in the commodities futures thing. And again, the Wall Street Journal, again, this market, uh, you know, and uh, Theranus is on the front page, uh, you know, by the way, underneath the soccer player. <laughs> then China does strike back. Right? You, you love this kind of popular Hollywood culture. The empire strikes back, now China strikes back. But anyway, in the Wall Street Journal, you, you have a page on commodity prices, and you know, um, uh, you, you'll, you'll have the um, agricultural futures. You can see here, market index. I, mean, I guess we need light. Uh, but anyway, the market index gives you all the commodity uh, futures as well. What he doesn't go into immediately in a, in a deep way in this section is the currency futures and how that might affect too. You know, again, you want to try to see the totality. You know, you want to try to see the interrelationships here, uh, you know, between commodities uh, futures um, and, uh, of course, the uh, currency futures, etc. So the, the commodity markets, as I said, and the, the uh, commodity exchange was first created as the hedge against weather conditions, crop failures, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it turned into a very speculative market where you would bet on the price of soybeans out nine months or the price of oil. So this has also been part of a new derivative market, which was originally intended about what the price of wheat may be three months, six months down the road. Now you're betting on betting whether the price of wheat will hit that hit that point. The three sixty is the truck again, the ice cream. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, it's entrepreneurial capital. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So this, um, this block would yeah. be uh, anyway, yeah. So uh, and then the the section and maybe we should uh, um, you know uh, stop there is the um, the bank capital. Maybe we can take up uh, bank capital and bank profit next time. Um, the uh, mobilization of capital, uh, share flotation, and speculation. You know, the new sphere of activity. So banks no longer just lending institution. They actually float shares and they speculate. Which chapter? 1910, chapter 10. Okay. The last 10 at the beginning of the section. So that's important to 
to look at. And then I'll, I'll go um, I'll go to the end of page 180 at the end of chapter, the last paragraph. Um, in print of transactions, this is the last second to last full paragraph, the material business relationship is always accompanied by a personal relationship, which appears as a direct relationship between members of society in contrast to the material social relations which characterize economic categories such as money, namely what is commonly called trust. This is the last paragraph. In this sense, a fully developed credit system is the antithesis of capitalism and represents organization and control as opposed to anarchy. And I'm sure he's referring to the anarchy of production that Marx uses, you know, time and time again. Um, it has its source in socialism, but has been adapted to capitalist society. It is a fraudulent kind of socialism for use by the few, um, uh, uh, modified to suit the needs of capitalism. And this is the, basically what we get in social socialist countries, actually existing socialism, the, the fraudulent notion. I think he also is anticipating that. It socializes other people's money for use by the few. At the outset, it suddenly opens up for the knights of credit, prodigious vistas. The barriers to capitalist production, private property seem to have fallen, and the entirely entire productive power of society appears to be placed at the disposal of the individual. The prospect intoxicates him, and in turn he intoxicates and swindles others. The original pioneers of credit were the romanticists of capitalists like Law and Perrier, and it was some time before the sober capitalist and the upper hand, the Gundermann vanquished Sakhar. And this is from the, the Emile Zola film, um, Movie, uh, I'm not the movie, but it was made into a movie by uh, Bresson. It's all his novel, Money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so any, any uh, questions, thoughts, or before we, uh, yeah? Josh, you have a. Uh, this is a very important section of, of finance capital, to my mind, because chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10 are really dealing with what the fundamentals are of what we're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. You know, we begin to see how the corporations are founded, how the IPO is done, what happens to the middleman, the promoter's profit. You know, we're able to see basically how this is mobilized, both eternally and in terms of a fixed temporality, one te obviously teleological versus the non-teleological. You know, and how we have built this mountain, if you will, of paper, or this pyramid scheme, if you will, that, you know, is now in the trillions and trillions, you know, maybe up to the zillion dollar level of leveraged paper, you know, built upon this schema, if you will, of the fictitious versus the real. In September, could yeah. you talk yeah, sure. some, maybe sure. about the rise of private equity and the power sure. of private equity? Sure, yeah. I had to order something from Toys R Us last month, and I engaged, be us, huh? I engaged <laughs> the poor guy on the other end of the phone, and I said, what are you going to do when it's over and start crying? Oh, oh no. shit. <laughs> <laughs> you mean after they're going out of business, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Toys be us. Yeah. I remember that, yeah. The big one in the Fulton Mall, remember? Yeah. On Flatbush, next to Junior's. Behind the, <laughs> they had Al B Square, where all the hip hop artists yeah. were. What a change, huh? Private, yeah. Yeah. Private equity loaded it up with debt, debt and, then, yeah. and then. Shut it up. Well, well, Fairway in your neighborhood, right? This is what happened with them, too. Fairway the also sold out, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, they've been uh, bought out by a private equity? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a little close that too. <laughs> you want a trip, go to uh, Fairway with Peter Bratzis. <laughs> <laughs> Be prepared for a lot of time there. <laughs> mm. Every little aisle. Yeah. It's like, you know, he was born there. You know? <laughs> mm. Yeah. 
So any thought? I mean, I, I think this is worth rereading. Yeah. You know, I think it's a good, you know, kind of introduction post Marx, chapters 25 and 29 of, uh, of Das Kapital, of the third volume. You know, you begin to see fictitious capital relationally, you know, instead of just as a term. You know, you begin to see how it operates in the system, et cetera. Yeah. Are these other chapters worth looking at? Yeah, the whole book is yeah. worth uh, looking at, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a major work in the history of, you know, yeah. of economic thought, you know. I mean, you know, and then Lenin argues with him in imperialism. Right. That, you know, you're still in the industrial capital productive phase, and there are all kinds of levels here, but, yeah, it's the overdue. You know, imperialism was a term first used by Hobson, the English theorist. Right. Well, he, he never left the Social Democratic Party, right? No, he never left the Social Democratic Party. He got elected in Germany. Huh? He was in Parliament in Germany right. up until '33. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then he was killed in Paris by the Gestapo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I don't know why I didn't.